right, Larry, can you hear me? Okay, I think we are okay. Okay, so let's let's do motion picture. Um, yeah, I hooked all this up, and then I realized there's no way for me to hear it. There's no speakers on this thing. Um, but so I'm just gonna have subtitles on and imagine the sound. Um, it's fine. <laughs> um. And I'll be, I'm going to have the, ch I'm, I'm going to have the, ch if I'm looking on the side, that's where I see you chat. So that's just what you notice that. Oh, wait a minute. I'll reset. There we are, split screen. Plunge right in. Yes, as a famous starship captain once said, as another famous starship captain once said, put me on speaker, damn it. Oh, no, wait. Uh, yes, they probably said that more than once. But the one I'm thinking of also said, no matter where we go, wherever our mission takes us, we will try to have a little fun along the way and always take a good engineer. Hello, everyone. Uh, oh, we would love to have a good engineer. Um, I think you should be hearing me okay era. now, folks. Um, Welcome to Life Support Live. Um, I am um, psychologist Dr. Ali. Uh, and I'm uh, Dr. Trek, Larry Nimichek, and apparently I'm the only one they can hear. Oh, no, now they, they hear can you. hear me now. Yeah, and <laughs> neither of us is a real engineer or oh, an AV <laughs> operator. Um, well, I, I, was, I was late, but I was talking. I was welcoming everybody 15 minutes ago, but nobody saw it. I was doing a great <laughs> job welcoming everybody without you. And telling the whole situation, and I finally realized that I, there was nobody chatting, which was a good clue <laughs> that no one knew it. Yeah. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we are here, um, and like the who said, we are here. We are here. <laughs> so, um, welcome to welcome to our lovely people. Um, uh, hi to Ghost Rider. We have some of our usuals here. Hello, Christoph. Uh, good to see you. Uh, Tim is here as well. Uh, Glenn is here. Linda, good to see you. Oh, we're doing that you. token welcome the chat thing like they do on all the streams. Well, it's a special and, uh, day. It's a different. Walk. It's a different. It's a different day. Good to see you, Livy. It is. Um, we, this is a, we've done this once or twice in midweek, so, you know, for holidays. Ho I would never do this. We'd never consider this except if it wasn't the fact that we thought a lot of people might be home, and it was, right. you know, it was an alternative to a Saturday, so, to a holiday Saturday. Um, Mary, good to see you here. Mm -hmm. uh, Tony mm -hmm. is here. Tony says, yay. Dave, um, we've got, we've got uh, some of the usuals. Um, uh, we've got some folks we haven't seen in a while. So, Larry, uh, this is a it's a special well, it's day good in time because we have a movie I haven't seen in a while. I haven't seen this movie in a long time either. So um, this actually we, we do this from time to time. We do these uh, watch alongs where we pick something from Star Trek and we watch it together. Larry, we were just talking in our in our whatever that was in the last half an hour. Um, the um, we've now done a little bit of everything we've done the original series um we have we have not done the animated series as far as a watch along 
as as, as far as watch along, we've done Next Generation, <laughs> we've done Deep Space Nine, we've done Voyager, we've done Voyager, right? Mm-hmm. We did. Um, we've done. We haven't. We've done Enterprise. Yes. Yes. I was. Gosh, if only we had some admins to help us update the episode <laughs> list. But um, <laughs> we haven't I, done Enterprise. Uh, I was thinking that we had done either the pilot or we hadn't done the pilot or Mirror Mirror. But I thought we'd done another one. But anyway, um, uh, we may not have. We've done Lower Decks. We, this is scintillating video, may I say? I'm, sure, is, I'm sure it is. I'm scintillating. Sure it is. Anyways, and we've done we've done um, uh, we've done the undiscovered country, and we did insurrection. So mm. we've got um, we haven't done the Kelvin timeline. Um, one of these days, I'm going to get you to there, um, but it's it'll be a long road. Um, so Larry, uh, what are we doing today? What movie are we doing today? The plan was to see the director's edition of Motion Picture. And I was saying, as I was saying for all the ghosts that were listening to me 20 minutes ago, uh, we just realized in the last couple of days that neither Paramount Plus nor almost anyone else has the director's edition free streaming. I know there's all this hoopla news about it coming out, about, uh, about the Motion Picture being remastered. Friends Darren and David and Mike are heading the team again that did it 20 years ago, only now for 4K. That's wonderful, but apparently they decided to have no <laughs> director's editions free on it. I mean, you can rent it on a couple of the services, but Paramount Plus doesn't have it. And in fact, last night, I was having trouble finding a clickable link for the movie on my mobile. I finally got it. I'm going to watch it today on my desktop because I couldn't ever get it on a mobile. Other people have said it's been fine. So you can't – so apologies, everybody. It's, uh, having discs is great, and I have my – I have my original 2001 disc set here. I know they've Blu-rayed it since then. Uh, I've got the, uh, they just I've got the Blu-ray, which uh, from the set that has uh, mm. the Captain's Summit, uh, Larry, that you... Uh... Oh, is that what that is? Yes, sir. Oh. Yes, sir. Some They put some bozo on that. Okay. <laughs> well, this is the motion picture collection. Okay. Yeah, that's the one I'm watching. Well, that's the... that's. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. It would be in the. This is an original series movie, not a, <laughs> not, a not a Trek, not a next gen. It makes sense. Anyway, I'm just gonna watch mine on my 2001. It doesn't. I don't care if it's Blu-ray or 4K or Pink Ray or Fred's Ray. It's uh, Fred's it's Ray. <laughs> Yabba dabba do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Fred. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay, so folks, um, some of you might be watching um, the, the version on. <laughs> okay, if you're new. <laughs> some of you might be watching. Um, happy holidays, folks. Hope you're staying well. <laughs> um, some of you might be. What a god in this coffee, Larry. Um, some of <laughs> some of you might be watching. I wish it was in my uh, diet. Uh, whatever this is, Dr. Pepper. Um. Yeah, as um, as Tim says, I don't care uh, to either way, Larry. Um, so some of you might be watching. Some of you might be renting this, in which case I tip my hat to you. Um, some of you might be streaming. Some of you may this. be watching Galaxy Quest, and that's just you know. Fun. <laughs> that's my. T- that's what we should have done. That's a good pick. That's a fun movie. Um, <clears throat> Our Bennett's favorite Star Trek movie. Ah, okay. uh, yeah. He confided to me. Okay. Uh, so some of you might be watching on uh, the Blu-ray version, and it's probably the director's cut. Um, some of you might be watching on Paramount+. Plus. Um, there's about a 10-minute difference to it. Um, right, Larry? Four. Four, four minute. Okay. Um, so that's okay. Whatever version you're watching, we're watching Star Trek together. That's all that really matters. And we're watching what I think is, is uh, an amazing film. Um, all right, mm-hmm. so Larry... Um, uh, you, uh, uh, you and I are both watching. Um, it's even more amazing as a social movement. But go ahead. Ooh, well, we'll talk about that. Okay. Um, so uh, we're both watching um, a disc version. So all we have to do is hit play. Um, mm-hmm. You want- now here's the thing. Do we want to watch the three minutes of? Because I timed it. I saw the timer. Are we going to listen to the three minutes of intermission music uh, or of uh, overture or? Yeah, I think we kind of have to if we want to stay in sync. Um, or we could skip to 303 um, chapters. But anyway, okay. 
then I will back up. Yeah, I let's um, let's do the intermission music just so we stay in sync. Or the um, overture. I said intermission. Music. Yeah, 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 yeah. The overture. Um, it is a um, <clears throat> like all good films of that era. An well, actually, overture is, about, is the way. This to was be one of the last ones to do it. So yeah. Because Robert Wise was an old-fashioned guy. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like Sound of Music with its uh, intermission and overture. West Side and... Story, which is yes. very topical again. Yes, yes, yes. Um, all right. You want to count us in, Larry? Hold on. I can't. I'm trying to back. See, I was all clued up at 3.03. Uh, and now I'm trying to get it to. Uh... Are you clued up or clueless? Because I feel clued. like we're. Uh... <laughs> queued up. The Brits say queued up, you know. As Not Mary says, um, the overture was so exciting way back in 1979. I agree. Well, um, that's what it's I beautiful about a to hear it. Movement. Hello. Okay, because now I'm stuck and I can't. Okay, hold on. I'm just going to eject my disc and come back. Oh, no. <laughs> what a... What a fun time we are having here at Life Sport Live. Life. So, um, uh, while while Larry is... Uh, is uh, doing the disc, um, I this was this was something I've wanted to revisit for a long time with all of you because I really uh, Nathaniel says last chance to play at two x. <laughs> oh, okay, there I got it. Okay, you got it. You're you're yeah. queued up. Okay, you want to count us in? Okay, okay, everybody. Um, here we go. One. I'm hitting. Uh, I'm hitting play on the director's edition, but you know your your mileage may vary. But we'll basically be there all together. We will also all basically all get to epsilon six, epsilon nine together. Okay. One, two, three. And um, wow. Okay, I could I could hear the movie through your through your thing which is uh did you tell everybody about your predicament no so i i'm able to play it folks um I was, I was planning to stream triumph after another today. <laughs> yeah, yeah i know i know um i was able to play it uh, <laughs> unless we want a copyright thing larry you might want to uh adjust your sound okay I can, I can hear your sound through through uh it's it's a beautiful overture. Uh, I love hearing it because I can't hear it. Oh, you know what uh, I've always done? I've always watched this on my iPad through an earphone, and that's how I avoided this. This is the first time I've ever had to because I didn't want to drag <laughs> down my computer. <laughs> of course, of course, this all makes sense. So um, I'll it, put my subtitles on then. If folks are wondering, I I um, can't, and I have to. I I I was planning like like Larry was as well that we would um uh we would be watching on on Paramount Plus because of course that would make sense right um the home of Star Trek would definitely have the director's edition the one that we've been we're clinging to that director's the edition the clinging of we're clinging on to it um it's the first clinging on to the yeah and uh, when big budget clinging on, when we find out we didn't, I, I decided to hook up, dig up my Blu-ray player, which has been not plugged in for a very long time. So I, I I'm able to watch it, um, but I can't I can't hear it because I I plugged it into my monitor so I can watch it. Okay, now I'm seeing the Paramount logo. Is that what you're seeing, Larry? Now? Uh, no, I'm only I am a minute fifty eight into the overture. Okay, you with, should... a minute, with a minute to go, I can jump up to the. No, 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 no. You should be seeing the <laughs> titles now. I'm guessing, right? Last night, when I checked this out, uh, the titles, the logo started at three o three. For me, on my two thousand and two disc, is my Blu-ray version the not the director's cut? Com is compact? that what's happening here? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I think I think next time we just go with hand puppets of Spock's brain is what we go with. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm I'm um I'm now seeing the titles, which is great. Uh well, I can, I can skip ahead. No, I mean Okay, well now I be... now I'm at 250 now you've covered enough with this scintillating commentary. I'm at three, two, okay, now I am, boom, boom, oh, no, 
Now I'm at the mountain. <laughs> You're at the mountain? Mm-hmm. Um, and the circle stars. Oh, yes. uh, the Paramount logo? Mm-hmm. I'm at the Paramount logo now. Okay. Okay. I just saw produced by Gene Roddenberry, directed by Robert Wise. Well, then you're on the right movie. Yes. <laughs> Not the right movie. That might be the one thing. Yeah, um, we're here. Now, are you still hearing my – are you still hearing the music come through? No, I'm not. Okay, I'm okay. Not. It's low enough that I won't. Okay. The film – Wait I'm a seeing... minute. This is just a big episode of motion of The Next Generation. What is this? I I know. I know. I'm, I am now seeing um, Klingons. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, Larry, take me back. Um, <laughs> to Tulsa? No. No. Take me back. Um, you saw this – in you're the, seeing you're seeing the Klingons. I'm, I'm going to fast Klingons. forward and yeah. see the Klingons with yeah. you. I am everybody uh, else. Everybody else, you can do the same thing. Um, I, I I must be watching the non-director's edition. Blue clouds how, smiling at me. How is this version not the director's edition? I don't know. I just remember a lot of the technophiles video files were grumbling all the way through. When I wasn't actively doing the magazine anymore, I let a lot of this fly by me. But I know there's been there's been so much mumbling over the years. Part of the mumbling has been getting the director's edition uh, upgraded. So can I just say, though, please, when I please, saw this say in something. the theater, yes, that's what I want to know. The whole approach of the Klingon ships, yes. the Klingon battle cruisers. I've told this story before. So we were all. So I had to see it a day late. I had to see wait and see this on December eighth because we were judging in our college's high school speech and debate tournament, and ah. our professor would not let us go on Friday night. I didn't know so, you did speech and debate. I did. I did speech and debate. I myself. did. But we were in theater, and we. It was high school. So anyway. So anyway, we're all in the chairs of the theater where we all saw big movies, and I didn't realize. But as they approached and came forward, and then do the pan over. Yeah. And there's Mark Leonard. There's Sarek. Uh, as they did that, I realized my little brother was sitting next to me, and he had his hand on my chest, and I was like leaning forward in my chair to get closer to the screen, and he sits back. Sit back. You're embarrassing me. And I'm like, if I thought, I would have said, what kind of a nerd are you? But I didn't you didn't talk that way. Then. <laughs> I'll never forget that, though. It was like, I can't get any closer to the ships. Look at the detail. So it was. Uh, Starts off promising. This was so awesome to see this. It looks beautiful. Um, now, what was it like for you to see these Klingons as uh, as, as this version of Klingons? Well, it was cool. Everybody, I mean, we'd seen the, you'd had the promotion for a while, and some of the teaser stuff had been out there, and we all knew Mark Leonard. I mean, if you're paying attention on, on slow motion 1979 media, you know, you were getting your fan, you're getting your rumor mill and your fanzine newsletters and things. But, uh, and I was in college, so I was supposedly paying attention to school, but um, this was, this was Epsilon all very nine. awesome. And yeah. No, not yet. We're getting the real time. <laughs> thing here of everybody's trying to look at that guy go that's mark leonard okay that's mark leonard but we all appreciated this and you know it felt it felt very 2001 ish not star wars ish at the time and here's epsilon 9 but this was all very cool because we're all we're not comparing it to I wasn't. A lot. Most of us weren't comparing it to Star Wars or Close Encounters. We were comparing it to TV Star Trek and going, "Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God!" Now, Larry, tell me what timestamp are you at right now? I am at. I'm watching the little guy, the little man. Uh, I'm at seven forty-seven. Seven forty-seven. Okay. And what's happening I, for you right now? Uh, there, we're just, it's the flybys of Epsilon 9, and the little guy in the spacesuit is flying by to give scale, and now we're about to zoom into the control station. Commander Branch, who look, it's the, who could have been, should have been Zahn. It's Mark Gatro. This is the last thing, just about the last thing shot for the movie. I am... Seeing the Klingon ships disappear, trying to escape and, and disappear. Right, right, right. And the and the V'ger photons. Yes. Is the first one here. They were so proud of this effect. And of course, the the whole thing with part of the drama about the motion picture, aside from the rewrites every day and the big interior fight going on, 
And the overruns was that part of the overruns was the vi the effects before ILM was a thing, but everybody was scrambling around after Star Wars. Um, they went with uh, Ralph Abel and Associates, who were um, Robert. Sorry, Robert Abel and Associates, who were whose claim to fame was Levi and Seven Up commercials that were all these new agey things. And so he was going to build up his studio on the motion picture. And spent like a year and a half buying stuff to do the effects, not doing the effects. So they got to be about eight months away and had nothing to show, really. Oh my gosh! So they went out and so the two, so um, they went out and got the two, Doug Trumbull and um, and uh, and Dykstra, uh, their houses all threw it threw in and tried to get things done, and the work was divided up. And and this put, we're seeing here was some of the earlier visual effects, which is why. When you were a fan waiting to see some of this footage for for the trailers in the summer, the first stuff you saw was all stuff from the sequence. Really, you saw the the blue digitizing of the Klingons and all that. So, so here's the director's edition approach to Vulcan, which was a little bit different than it didn't have the, the all the statues on legs that you saw in the. The whole point of the director's edition was getting back to Robert Wise's original intention because the reason. Everybody felt the motion picture was slow when they saw it in theaters was because they had – there we go, uh, the statues. They uh, they didn't have time to edit that. They were throwing the visual effects things off so fast to be able to make the guaranteed contract date of December 7th or Paramount would have owed all the, the theaters that committed to showing it. They would have lost millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, so they were racing to get this done. And they weren't editing the visual effects sequences the way you would edit anything. The live action was edited. So the reason it felt slow and ponderous because they were just throwing <laughs> throwing the thing in and shipping it. And they talked about, like three weeks later, they talked about, we've got some letters, we may do them on Trek Files, where they talked about, let's go back and do an edit. And by that time, Paramount was going, no, just let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> so the reason everybody thinks about it being so slow is... Um, is because none of those long effect sequences were edited down to really pace it in the movie. <clears throat> so, so here's, here's the, yeah, this is all up at Miniver's Terrace in uh, Yellowstone. So the, the the statues with the the giant feet in behind Spock <laughs> here, that is the theatrical cut. This is all the same. What I was talking about different was the matte paintings. Oh, okay. There were more matte paintings for landscaping. Now, and of course, they did this in English. They decided after the fact. To uh, to make it Vulcan, and I shouldn't put out uh, the ch I don't know. Hey, hey, chat! I haven't even been paying attention. I'm sorry. Um, I should come down and see. They adapted language to fit the the lip movements. The original screen Vulcan was um, of any duration was uh, yeah. You have not achieved colon arm. Um, <clears throat> this is the first time we're hearing about Colin R. Right? right, right. Colin R is a new thing invented for this movie, and this set that we're seeing these these terracotta stones in that foot, and the bit behind. This was set pieces that were shipped up to uh, the only location shot in the whole movie is this, and it's not what it really is. It's Miniver's Terrace. Those those steaming. Plants those those tiles and that foot are all brought in and set up over the the landscape of Yellowstone, which you see there at the very back of the scene. I'm at uh, by the way, I'm at twelve fifty. I just and yeah. This is the first time we ever, aside from saying the plaque on the Enterprise Bridge saying San Francisco Navy Yards, this is the only the first time that we knew that Starfleet headquarters was in San Francisco. Really? Nobody had ever said that before on film. Which is, see, this is, there are so many reasons why I, I love this movie. Um, and billions of dollars in all those alien costumes they were bragging about and promotional stuff, and they're all in the background of this scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, let's, let's talk about the costumes. Um, we just, uh, there was a comment here... Uh, Nathaniel said, can I say I don't mind the cut of the uniforms? It's the colors that bother me. Mm -hmm. So let, let's take a look at the uniforms here. Um, 
I think the the belt, belt buckle communicator thing is pretty cool. Um, they do look a little pajama. It's called a scan in the in the novel in Jean's um, novel. What yeah. are they called? It was called a per scan, like per personal scan. scanner. Oh, okay. Um, in the novel, but it was never referred to on screen. So yeah. I do think the um, Commander Sonak. Commander Sonak. The, the the they do look a little pajama esque for me. Which is my only concern. They look very comfortable. They look very Space 1999-ish, <laughs> 70s sci-fi-ish. Yeah. They do. They and do. the palette is right out of 2001. See, Robert Wise was right there with the leading sci-fi of 10 years earlier. <laughs> Pre-Star Wars. <laughs> but now this, you know, things like this were very cool. And this, you know, you turn oh, this the... upside down and you've got Gamma Regular Station. Right. So. Yeah, to, to come in the next film. you make the second movie for less than the first one? I can make three movies for the cost of the first one, sir. Har Bennett's famous reply to Charles Bloodhorn. Cargo. Everybody was like, but it, it was so cool to see the ship models they'd done. It's just amazing. It's like every single person who worked in visual effects and their grandma and their grandma's dog and their grandma's dog handler were working, were like gluing and modeling and painting things. There's the... Alien Ensign over there, boy, who was a Randorite. You didn't. There was so much stuff you didn't know unless you like read the promo stuff or you read the <laughs> everything later on. And everybody was like, "Oh, they changed the transporter. Okay, it's got to be new. It's got to be exciting. It's got to be." Louise says, "After this pandemic, pajamas would be the norm." So I think that, given COVID nineteen, it would make sense that they might be wearing these uniforms. Um, okay, so Larry. But I, that said, the admiral's outfit is is awesome. So um, a little bit of a of a tie into history. <laughs> Um, the Commander Sornak, was he... Sonak. A, 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 what is his name? Sonak. Sonak. Like sonar, Yeah. only change the R to K. Okay, I'm at the um, approach to Enterprise, so this is going to be give us about 10 minutes to talk. Uh, <laughs> so, I must be about five seconds behind you, because they're talking in the pod here, but we'll be there. Okay, so we're, we're pretty close to its sake, <laughs> as good as it's going to get. So, um, was he a character from uh, Phase 2? No. Not that I think of, no. Okay. For some reason, um, he looks, he lo I thought maybe. Now, what's, uh, can you clear up some of the confusion here? How much of this was the story, was the pilot to Star Trek Phase 2? Well, it, it really, it was basically the idea. <clears throat> now, the idea, you know, the idea to kill off Ailey and Decker or, or to merge them and have them go off. Obviously, Ailey and Decker were going to be regular characters. That's not the way the original Phase 2 pilot, which was called In Thy Image. Mm. It's not the way it ended because it wound up with Decker and Ailey, you know, still around. So, uh, and you caught me on that one. Um, but uh, if that was, you know, it was it was on this TV budget in the 70s, so they didn't plan it so elaborately. So in, I just remember in thy image, the probe that uh, comes aboard the ship and all that, and and Chekhov says it reminds him of his his great aunt Tasha. So all the way through the movie, they keep calling the uh, the pro what we call the Ilea probe. They called Tasha for a few drafts, and which is weird because I read that now and I think of Tasha Yar, but. Mm. There you go. It was a yeah, you know. but it was basically kind of the same thing pulled down. And people, a lot of people are affected by the novelization, and the fact that uh, you know the scenes that were in the novel that weren't in the movie, like when Kirk Kirk has an implant that he gets an alert, and he's over in the Mediterranean. There's all this stuff about what the Mediterranean looks like, and and uh, and he beams himself to you know he doesn't uh, take a shuttle. He he beams over to Starfleet and runs in and there's actually an, a scene with Admiral Nagura and all that and and a lot of backstory to the fact that Kirk was ha, had a marriage contract for three years when he was in between ships and all of the marriage stuff. contract that there was a lot of Gene Roddenberry guru 70s guruism put into the, and the whole thing of the Tahila and trying to get a handle on exactly what kind of close relationship Kirk and Spock had and was trying to address you know uh, basically, slash fandom, you know, Kirk's Kirk KS fandom, and saying, well, they weren't really lovers, but they were closer than brothers, but they weren't lovers, <laughs> although it could be interpreted. There's a Vulcan concept called Tahila, and it was a sop to all the, you know, the the pushing the the Kirk Spock fandom uh, zine writers, and to address <laughs> that. But 
So, anyway. so to get swept up in the moment a little bit here, oh, yes. we've got uh, Libby is saying this is bringing back emotional memories for me watching this first time in the theater. Um, Tim says, same here. I was only nine years old and instantly swept away. Mary says, I agree, for, but for me, it was my sister Sally. This, I, this is just Star Trek movie magic here. Kirk and Scotty <laughs> seeing the refit Enterprise together. The, the, the new theme swelling are the, here. Are we going to have the, uh, where's the reflection? Okay. <clears throat> right. Now, see, everybody makes fun of this entire sequence, and that's fine. But what I tell people all the time, you have to look at motion picture as a motion picture yes. that, that anybody can critique like any other movie. Yes. And that's fine. But the motion picture is also a social movement because no other old dead TV show had ever been brought back to life by a fan movement mm. and made into a big budget motion picture. And that that flyby was for there it is. That wasn't in the theatrical cut. They did the. They did the overlay for this. That This whole sequence was all meant to be a reward for fans that fought and fought and fought and did something that had never been done before. Yeah. And that's what this was. So if you were sitting in the theater in December 1979, you were eating. Now, some people were like going, oh, come on, come on, get already. These, these, of course, were the shippers who didn't care about background. But for most of fandom, this was a, this was a reward. This was as much a reward for fandom as – Having all the extras in the rec deck scene that they well, have. Would I? So I, I, I did not see this in the theaters. I was not around then. Um, but what I, what I, I <laughs> what I love about this um, <laughs> is if you are watching this as someone who doesn't know Star Trek, um, one thing that's kind of clear here is these two people love this ship. Kirk loves this ship. Scotty loves this ship it is a beautiful sequence um i i think it really it's it's adding a lot of uh character not only to kirk and scotty but to the enterprise as a character here as well um you really are getting um every inch and in granny of that starship uh this is well. The other thing is, this is the first time we ever saw it. You know, on TV, you always saw yeah. flybys of the ship. You never got, you know, and the the closest you got to having any scale was when the shuttlecraft would take off. Yeah, and that was kind of stilted. This is like they are determined to make you know exactly how big this ship yeah, is. Yeah, you really the get the scale. It's also refit, so everybody's looking at all the refit details. Yes, the first time. yeah. Uh, it's all the model details. I mean, this. I think the scene is gorgeous. And Jerry Goldsmith's score here, Larry, is so, so good. Um, how um, do you have any any context here for about the score and how that theme came together? It's Jerry Goldsmith. <laughs> I mean, I. Um, <laughs> I just, I'm just at where they're getting off the travel pot. Same oh, here. I should, We're in sync yeah. now, I think. <clears throat> and having the idea that the, the the cargo bay was at the back of the, like if you got off a shuttle, you could look in the back and see, you know, toward the front of the ship. You'd look forward, but you'd see all that cargo activity. But the thought that Andy Probert put into the designing the ship and how it would work and why the cargo modules looked the way they did. And like, like well, I'm looking at pieces we may be out of sync. But this whole thing about the, you know, the modularity of it all. Everybody was just like, oh, my God. It's like they put all this work into it, and you see just little bits and pieces. But to go into a turbo lift and have the little dot flow along on the – that was just blowing everybody – okay. It was blowing my mind. I'm, anyway. I'm see, so I'm seeing the bridge here, and I'm seeing uh -huh. this person standing on a on a little hover pad to to fix the, the um, whatever is going on in the bridge. I love that. I love this little detail. It does seem so much more um, – future forward um mm -hmm. and i also love the diversity of the crew that we're seeing here i love um wow it's so it, this is just so cool to see to see them together mm -hmm. to see some familiar faces and to see some new ones yeah one alien one alien <clears throat> and nobody knew it in this movie, but that's a Randorite with two A's. The uh, you, the person his credit with the... says Alien Boy. <laughs> Do we ever see that species again? I think, I think it's there. You see another one in the ship. Well, the uh, um, 
The guy who was the MC a lot of seventies cons, we had him on Trek Files. Uh, he played one on the. He was uh, Red Alert know. somewhere in Los Angeles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was gonna say, should I grab my? Thing? Yeah. Um, this is extended scene. Our chances of getting back. Al- I love that line. It's like, why did they cut that line? Did you see it? Where he says, "Our chances of getting back from this mission may have just doubled or whatever." That line wasn't in the original theatrical. No, I did not see that line. Um, so I'm seeing engineering here for the mm-hmm. first time. And Larry, I see the um, I see the blueprints here that eventually will be the 1701D um, mm-hmm. engineering and and also a little bit of uh, Voyager's warp core here as well. Um, it's technically not, but I always thought it secretly was. But they say it wasn't, but yeah. <laughs> um, so one, one thing I want to um, just... I've had a debate with my friends about this. So the motion picture score um, becomes the next generation theme. <laughs> he swivels himself around. Uh, I, I really... I don't like the fact that the next generation theme is the motion picture theme. Cause to me, again, I had a very backwards introduction to Star Trek. I watched Star Trek six for the first time. Then I watched the movies out of order based on how I could rent them from Blockbuster. I don't know in what order I saw motion picture. It's just picture. a sad excuse for a fan. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just take my fan card, uh, throw it, throw it into the, the airlock. Um, so I saw these things all out of order. But w- one thing that was clear is um, the theme um, for me of the motion picture was the original series theme. That was just how it clicked in my head. And so when I saw Next Generation after watching some of the movies, it was a little jarring to me that it was the same music. I always felt like the uh, the Next Generation cast got a little ripped off since they didn't get their own theme not really until first contact that they have their own theme. So I, I don't know how you feel about this, but to me, the music in this movie is so synonymous with the original cast. But I don't know. I don't know if you have any thoughts about this. Well, I forget about it until I sit down to watch it again because they didn't really use it again. Now, I always think of – I know there's a Klingon theme in um, – in in Star Trek three, but I always think of the Klingon theme here as the the to me that is the Klingon theme, for one thing. Yeah, but yeah, the and the what one thing um, I guess oh where is she take where are they taking all those eggs? I just don't I don't know. Um, that, that looks like an egg carton. Uh, I always like to appreciate the way this version of that theme music starts off with that boom, boom, da, 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 yeah. you know, yeah. because the next generation basically starts off with the, the slower, you know, the yeah. over and then the glissando into the da, 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 but this one has that little boom, boom, da, 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 you know, kind of a theatrical thing. Are you up to the, uh, transport? Uh, yeah, this is a bit horrifying. Um, you have seen this before, right? I have, so I have. It's been a long time. Everybody uh, was, everybody oof. knew she was coming, but everybody was glad to see, you know, Grace Lee Whitney be yeah. Yeoman Rand there. Or not, but she's Transporter Chief Rand now. It's... I got there for me. And the, in the novel, the woman that's there with Sonak was Lori Siani, who was a vice admiral that had been Kirk's three-year wife on the contract he didn't renew. And that uh, Nagura had used to get him to come in and take this mission, and then he watches. So it's not over. Wa- he's not only watching Sonak die; he watches his colleague and one-time wife die in the novel, which was beefed up later. You look at the script; it's not there. It's just a thing that Gene threw in to kind of beef up the power of this scene, like it needed any more beefing up. So I I love that we get as as horrific it is as it is um, this transporter accident also shows you the the gravity no pun intended of of space flight and of of the star trek universe and i I don't know if we had seen a transporter uh loss yet to date in the original series um nothing really is coming to my mind not really there were transporter accidents but it like you split kirk in half or we've got a they would say beam out you know nomad wide dispersion you know or you know 
but yeah, you didn't see an actual death in the trench. But again, everybody used to talk about how disposable the red shirts were. Did people, I mean, occasionally Spock, you know, Kirk would say, oh my God, his dad got me into the academy. But people didn't really linger over death the way all of those characters did. Yeah, yeah. It it really shows you, it adds some stakes here. And uh, Robert Weiss, you know, uh, you want to talk about red shirts? I'm going to take away the color red from this entire film. <laughs> Also blue, green, yeah, no. Um, again, they're, it's very 70s, you know, 70s palette sci-fi, which was already starting to change, but... Um, L- Libby says the um, the transporter scene um, scared me to death. I, it still bothers me a lot. It, it's quite... Um, and this scene. The scene. Let's talk about... So, Larry, you've talked a lot about the scene. Um, well, the rec deck, there's a lot of guest extras in this. There's a lot of just fans. There are a lot of paid union extras who are pissed off that so many extras were fans. Uh, yeah, shot for two days. A lot of people are in this. Uh, Denise Okuda, before she knew Mike, is in that scene. But oh, B. Wow. Joe Trimble, I mean, there's tons of... Robert Wise's wife is right there in the front row that everybody thinks is B. Joe. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And this, and that back wall is the first uh, there's things just you look at this in hindsight now see the enterprise wall memorial wall mm-hmm, over there mm-hmm. which has confused people because they at the time you know nobody knew the nx01 was coming nobody knew but that's the first time that whole thing about having memorial ships you know in some kind of a display somewhere in a ready room on a wall somewhere that's the first time that was done but it gave you a sense of instant you know history and gravitas but there was so much about that scene that was oh and look and, and here's a it's it's really so watching this you see Zon how lives here yeah Martin Gautreaux. you see how um, diversity of crew that character in the back is brought back for uh, so I'm sorry Discovery and Lower Decks keep bringing back these aliens yeah. that were one time aliens like there's a Beetlejuice in the back that was the, a Beetlejuice <laughs> Who was the fl- who was the crossover guy that shows you that shows you Discovery is aware of the Kelvin universe? That's the species they used for that. Oh right, 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 right. With the better with the better face mask on. The better. Yeah. Mask. Well, I I love just the diversity we're seeing here. This is um, the pre-recycled film from Independence Day that they used. To, no, I'm kidding. That sh- every time I see the shadow now coming over Epsilon Nine, I think of the Independence Day. So we're uh, we're seeing a lot of diversity in terms of aliens that are on the crew. We're also seeing a lot of diversity in terms of um, humans and Native cultural American. background. Yeah. Right. So it's um, it's very cool to see that that aspect of the original series is um, is here and is uh, being expanded upon, built upon. Um, and I just saw an Andorian. Um, um, mm-hmm. Really great to see that. Um, getting back to the the music here, um, oh those bass strings, yeah. So it seems like we've got a little bit of uh, of diversity here in what um, in what people are thinking about uh, with the music here. Um, Christoph says the TNG music um, in the main menu of the disc confused me too. <laughs> um, and Tim says there was an original theme recorded for TNG by Dennis mm-hmm. McCarthy. Mm-hmm. Is that available to hear somewhere? I think it is. I have it's. I know I've heard it. So I'm trying. Oh, to I've got to. I've got to listen to yeah. that. I don't think I've. I don't think I've heard that. Um, <laughs> Charlotte says I think most people associate that music with the Next Generation. Uh, I think it mm-hmm. probably depends on when you became a fan and how you got in- introduced to this stuff. Uh, Tim, Tim Hans noticed, I was going to say this a while ago, uh, the problematic history of, uh, of Matt Decker or Stephen Collins. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I, Leah and Delton's and shaving her head and all the drama and yeah, everything with that. Why look, it's Riker and Troy version one half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was there also a Gene Roddenberry guru esqueness to this character? Was he you trying think? to say something? <laughs> yeah. You think <laughs> he was trying to liberate sexuality here and calling calling humans, you know, a sexually naive species and all of that. 
And there was – is this the extended scene? Surely it is now where Sulu stumped – it's really interesting now. I don't know, know and don't George call me Shirley. Gay, but to have, have George react to fumbling and stumbling around with her pheromones. Now, see, Admiral Kirk has is a legend, so the idea that she goes, ah, eh, 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 and then she goes off, like, can I do anything else for you, Admiral? Okay, now this was, you know, as a McCoy guy, this was a big moment. And everybody laughs about this being, you know, Disco McCoy now, but... Uh, I'm, I'm at the McCoy beam in. Me too, no, I'm me at, too. Uh, I'll do a... Uh, so I'm at 3432, just for the heck of it. So uh, McCoy is adding a much needed um, dose emotion. of humor and reality. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yes. And uh, an, I was going to say an emotional counterpoint <clears throat> to Kirk. Um, you really feel him like just immediately sort of calling him out like they drafted me, Jib. Um, why do we it's always been, call it a no- like two years, but he's been off in the hills of Georgia with animals. But boy, he's, <laughs> you know, deciphering the Fabrini, none of which you get in this scene. It's all in the novel. But I hear chapels in MD now. His, but the fakeness of his beard always did bug me. I know engineers, they always love to change love things. To change things. Um, mm-hmm. It's so great to see, you really feel him return. Um, just Yeah, just about the time you thought this was going to be horribly sterile, you got a dose of McCoy to save the movie, and then it moves on anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, and again, the theme, as they're preparing to leave Space mm-hmm. Dog, the theme is... Um, yeah. That's so gorgeous. Yeah, that doom doodle doom doom doodle. Yeah. It's a slow <clears throat> build. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there we go. Getting from there to here. <laughs> do, 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 do. Uh, this theme is we we really get we get so spoiled, Larry, because we uh, get yeah. we get this score. And then we get James Horner scored or Wrath of Khan. These two themes are so gorgeous. Uh. You don't need anything till first contact. Oh, I know people are going to hate me, but yeah. Now, this did get it. People did make fun of why do we have to turn all these lights for deep space, but you know. Well, it helps with visibility. <laughs> it's going to be hard to see that shit. You can let all your supervillains know exactly who they're fighting. Yeah. This, you know, the color's been enhanced and cleaned up for some of these later editions, but it it did still seem in the... I do remember thinking how... I'm trying to remember... I'm trying to separate now if it was me looking at, like, the photo novel, you know, or if it was me in the theater actually looking at it, because that was the main way you saw color on this. Do I still have mine up here somewhere? Surely I do. Yeah. Uh, Libby says that uh, Gene would love the sexuality and, and discovery, LOL. Uh, I think you're right about that, Libby. I totally know that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, here it is. Yeah. So, you know, you had the photo You had the photo novels, but you, so it was a thing to have the photo story. So, oh. you know, if you couldn't afford the $80 mo- videotape yet... Oh, I've never seen that. Oh, yeah, it's the... It's, it's like it's a comic photo. book, kind of. Well, you've seen the... I mean, you've seen the... Um, Oops. You've seen the photo novels, right? No, I've never seen this. Oh, you call yourself a fan? No, anyway. <laughs> I have... So they did one for the, and they did a black and white one for Wrath of Khan, then they dropped it. Because mm. by then people had video and they didn't care. But did he say warp 0. 0.5? Yes, he did. It was, it was wonderful presaging. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess. I'm kidding. I mean, that's no, a pretty fast impulse. Mm-hmm. But you know the whole thing about how they sculpt, how they designed in the best old school motion picture tradition, 
how they designed engineering with a with a receding uh, false perspective. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah. to make it look like it goes way back. And they yeah. actually had little people in the back. So you would, you know, that forced the perspective even more. Orbital departure on viewer. But the thing, one thing, I guess, in hindsight, I was like, why is everybody standing? It's like, would you want to stand there for hours and hours and hours? Right. We're going to separate the important people from the dinky people. <laughs> the important people get chairs. The dinky crew have to stand up. They also pass pretty close to Jupiter. I got to imagine you're using a lot of uh, dilithium crystals to escape the, the gravity there with Jupiter. This part, this captain's log part feels very TOS. Maybe that's because we get the actually use the Alexander Courage yeah. theme here. Yeah. No, it's it's cool to get that little hit of TOS. That little nod. Yeah. Yeah. Before they they can embrace it fully. Yeah, all the composers would go on and Nathaniel says he owned the photo novels. Jim. Uh, I was about to say call you Jim. <laughs> no, you are Larry. You're well, they Jim. were great for reference. You know, before you could freeze frame a video, that's what you, it's, it was like having your own clip collection right there in your hand. So at this point, Spock is... There's no is, chair arm to lean on, so McCoy has to lean on the railing. That The chairs are so dinky with their little, you know, seat belt arms. He has to come in and noodle him by leaning over the rail. Oh, the the engineers just changed their uniforms to get ready for warp. Is that what 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 just happened? They were trying to make warp drive not look like some cardboard Christmas light thing. Yeah, they're the radiation in the. They're not sure, but now you could you could canonize this and say that they're not sure about the new warp drive system. So they're all kind of like when the astronauts went into isolation after the sure. first couple of moon landings, and then they gave it up when they knew it was fine. You could almost say like they're testing this new refit engine, Whoa. so they're all wearing their rad suits. Hmm? The new warp effect. Yeah. But you'd never seen uh, engineering feel engineering-y. Wormhole. Hold on. How'd that happen? It's it's an imbalance in the matter antimatter mixture, but I wouldn't expect you to know. They were so proud of this. Are there any now, this profits is the one in this thing that Robert April did. Oh, and the, the yeah. Everybody who laughs about no people have forgotten that they they one of the things they thought they would fix from the original series was having the the seats clamp in so you wouldn't people wouldn't go flying around the bridge anymore. And finally, they just decided that it was much better just to invent um, inertial dampers that go that are overpowered than than worry about having seat belts for another generation. Yeah, Robert Averill did this wormhole and did this camera shot. I like how Which McCoy is just, just holding on. <laughs> well, that's the story of his life. He's just holding on. I always like how it's like Ilea, like the gravity must be different on Delta Four because she jiggles more than everybody else combined. <laughs> everybody else is kind of like riding it out, and she's she's doing this. And it was not gratuitous. Time to impact. No, the favorite line of this scene's coming up in a minute. I do like their watches. They look pretty cool. The wrist communicators. Yeah. Belay that phaser order. <laughs> <laughs> That's the line of the yeah. I love how everybody standing up is just hanging onto their console and they're just fine. But space travel seems a lot more scary in the motion picture than it does the original series. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing, though. Um, nobody fires a phaser in this movie. There's one photon torpedo fired here, but nobody – they go to all the trouble yeah. to design the phasers and all that, and all you see are a couple of security guards holding them. <laughs> There's Anderson not. Anderson Perez. Yeah. 
Eeeen. I'm trying to figure out the science here. So they went to warp. They got stuck in a wormhole. The wormhole <laughs> is significantly disrupting time, slowing it down significantly. And there's an asteroid in this wormhole? An asteroid got sucked. They there there was not a it's not a naturally occurring wormhole. It's a like a subspace interface. There was an imbalance in their warp engines. And it's not that it's people think that if they blow up the asteroid, they get out of the wormhole. It's that that there was an asteroid in the wormhole and it was going to they had no defense against it. Like the the asteroid deflector wouldn't work in the wormhole. Okay. so they had to get rid of the wormhole. And it happened that the the shock to the local space by destroying that is what busted them out of the wormhole. Okay. but it kind of all flew by everybody. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Understood. But for a lot of people thought, oh, you shoot an asteroid and that's how you get out of a wormhole. It's like, well, no, that's not, it's not, that wasn't the plan. They just had to get rid of the asteroid because they were defenseless. Normally, the main deflector would have deflected the asteroid. But it- um, Zahir is beaming in to say, I'm with family, so popping in to say hi. Fun fact, I think I might be related distantly by marriage to the actress who played Ilea. Princess uh, Kambada. There we go. There we go, Zaheer. Who was um, a uh, Miss India we're playing, and uh, died very yeah, way too young soon young. after this. Yeah. Um, seven degrees of separation of motion picture here. Um, mm. Well, that wormhole was interesting. Um, getting back to the show here, Christoph says, for some <laughs> Trek, some TOS and early TNG, those um, photo novels were the first version to arrive in the German market as weekly magazines, sometimes with story differences. Also, often with cheap local actors standing in for photos, replacing the main cast photos to avoid photo license costs and copyright issues. There you go. <laughs> it was such a different world back then when we couldn't all watch the same episode and movies at the exact same time. Don't tell that to Paramount Plus. They think it's still, you know, 1979. <laughs> or they did, apparently. We'll just let them hang there for six months. So this is like the biggest scene in the new Captain's Quarters, which is so bland. But this would get reused. <laughs> I love the big plastic triangles there on the control face. But this is what be, this is what was reused for the Junior Officer Quarters on uh, Next Generation. That curved wall. Oh, oh, yeah, they that was saved. Like Warp and, they Data saved and Warp the set? quarters and Jordy's. Yeah. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. This part of the set. It goes from being the captain's quarters in motion picture to being the junior officer's quarters. On boy, that says a lot about uh, 1701 versus 1701 D, doesn't it? <laughs> and what's you know, and then Ratha Khan when they go in to watch the Genesis tape. Genesis. (laughs) From what we choose to deposit upon it. I always love the way she says that. But you know, you get that um, that that round doorway arch. Anyway, they they go in and they they warmify it up. Nick Meyer didn't want any of this cold, cold seventies palette. And you look at his quarters in Ratha Khan and it's got wood grain and it's got the warmth stuff in it and, well and, and, and you see just, his his apartment in in san francisco the is, control interface is, is uh yeah this is this is so troy Riker right here this yeah this moment is I'm telling yeah <laughs> i'm telling you So someday you will be a, someday you will be a preacher on seventh heaven, but it won't save you from being disgraced in the end. Okay. Married to the marine biologist in the fourth movie. Um, oh, the beard is okay. gone. The beard is gone. Gosh, he's been there for ten minutes already. Come on, they look so young, uh, Larry. They're so young. He's got a little. Yeah, you think this is something you should you should watch. Uh, the you should watch the Changeling. <clears throat> but I remember thinking also it was cool that they had more than one color. They had more than three colors. Like white was command on the patch. White mm-hmm. was command. Green was medical. Orange was science. Red was engine. Yeah, red was still engineering. Boy, look at the size of that plasma screen. Okay. 
That is a huge screen. It's well, you're bigger. the captain. You get the big screen. Well, it's bigger than uh, Picard's at his quarters. Yeah. yeah. This is huge. <laughs> That's bigger than the original screen in the cage. Oh, yeah. Which shows you, which shows you how, you know, like seven years later or whatever. And, but I did like, it's like they built this whole set just so they could do the sliding dark doors. <laughs> <laughs> Mood and scene. <laughs> ah, I wonder who's in this <laughs> ship, Larry. I remember thinking they kept calling it the Vulcan shuttle, and it was like, okay, so is it like a ship registered to Vulcan, or is it like a Vulcan designed it, but it's a Federation shuttle? I mean, I'm, I remember getting all in a wad about. But it docks with the Enterprise, so it's like an okay, so it's like a governmental, you know. It's yeah, I'm guessing it's though. It's led for a sublight shuttle. It's uh, uh yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I mean, this whole scene looks very cool. Um, what is this turning around? That seems like a very a roundabout way of turning the, the shuttle around. Hey, just be glad that the shuttle pilot didn't circle around the ship for 20 minutes. Dave says it's the Vulcan space sled, uh, which uh, which seems right. Um, look real quick, it's security. It's a phaser. The, the security quick. guys, um, they look a little bit like that in future movies, don't they? They have that similar they, armor. They kind of kept some of that. I don't think they kept the football helmet, but the, you know, the 1890s football helmet. But they kept the... <laughs> They looked almost as clunky in the at the prison, and um, they weren't shipbell crew. They had a different, slightly different thing. But then, then they had a gear. What? Um, oh, I'm thinking something different. I started to say some of that kept over for the pilot of next gen, but not really. Linda's asking for the Paramount Plus timestamp. I switched over to Paramount Plus actually, since I realized I'm watching the same version oh. as my Blu-ray. So I am um, Linda. This is going to be a little delayed for you once you hear it, but I am currently at forty eight. 14. Um, oh, okay. So Did few, Spock just come into the Spock console just arrived. to the bridge? Spock just arrived okay. to the bridge. See, I'm at 5059 on my um, disc. 5102. I remember trying to think, all those light bright controls, like, was this a big improvement on our Christmas lights that aren't labeled? And now we have a million light brights that aren't controlled, that aren't labeled. But the new tricorder made a lot of sense. And they had it all designed up and never got to show it off, really. Now, why did Spock join them? Did I miss that? Because he had, had the same vision of Vija. Oh, that, right. That, yeah, he had, had a... That's what stopped his Tehila yeah. ceremony. He got emotional. And see, everybody wanted to see some kind of a flicker there between Chapel and Spock again. But there's like, they don't, they don't go there. It's how we all feel, Mr. Spock. So Spock, got to remember you got to remember the dynamic here with Leonard Nimoy and how he wasn't going to be part of Phase Two. But when they went to the, I mean, you can read about how all the all the high level Paramount shenanigans. It was like you talk about making this movie, but on a totally different plane. Was it was like a special mission from the UN to get <laughs> Leonard Nimoy back in and negotiate, and you know. So he wasn't going to do Phase Two. Was um, was Shatner? Yeah. Oh, huh. no, yeah, Phase 2 was all cast with Di Ilea and Decker as the new characters. And then Zahn, who was David Gautreau. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe I should have explained yeah, that. Yeah, please. Commander Branch at Epsilon, Epsilon 9, that actor, David Gautreau, was originally supposed to play Zahn, the replacement Vulcan full blood, to Spock in Phase 2. And then, and then there was a thing about maybe they'd have Spock in the pilot to help get it launched and launch the new network. The fourth network at the time, and then that fell off, and Zahn was going to be the ongoing Vulcan, but he would be a full blood and he'd be young. And so they'd still have a Vulcan, because how can you do Star Trek without a lead Vulcan? And then when they went to the motion picture and the whole dynamic changed, they had to come up and tell David Gautreau that. And for a while, they were going to do a theatrical movie and have that launch the series on the new network, and then that went away, and it just became a standalone movie. And by that time, they had to tell David Gautreau that. 
we're, we're, we'll pay off your contract and we'll let you be Branch in this one scene, but we're going to have Nimoy be Spock, which was a big, you know, disappointment. So, Sp- but it's, it, yeah. So, and in the story here, Spock arrives and he basically fixes the warp core. It's, yes, without dying. Yeah, it's funny, right? Because Spock shows up and suddenly. The Enterprise is moving ahead at, at, at full speed, which is what the movie feels like now, too. <laughs> now that we've got our we got we've got actually, our three leads here. Well, actually, to me, it's like the the get the gang back together sequence is like the hard the highlight of the movie. And then after that's when it bogs down. But mm. this is some old this is like some old look at some old Jerry Finneman. Let's throw some green light in this dark in this room and give it color. But the, the thing about this, this was like a precursor to 10 forward. This was the lounge at the back of the primary hull or the bridge module. So you're looking straight out the back, except in the movie, they didn't have you didn't see like the nacelles. It was skewed to one side. But, see, that's botanical. There's some botanical garden growing back there in that. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah. But this thing all looks like an, a, a 1975 airport. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. TWA um, colors yeah, yeah. here. Yep. Yeah, the idea of the actual uniforms, you know, being everybody didn't have one uniform and the captain got one special one. We happen to be going your way. Yeah, from day one, McCoy was like the uh, the saving grace of this movie in a lot of ways, and a lot of the other movies too. He was even—it's like all the characters got, you know. The, it's amazing to me how the movies were so good to the lower decks, uh, not lower decks really. The senior, the junior senior officers got more equality of time in the in the movie era than they ever did in the the old TV lead second banana and everybody else era of billing and paying. And the movies, they got equalized because they'd had 10 years of fan love. Sure. And so that was kind of the demand. And on Next Generation, you had the family ensemble, you know, the post-Hill Street Blues. We have an ensemble TV cast. And then the movies turned into... The flip. Data, Picard lead, show. Yeah, lead, second lead and everybody else. It was like yeah. Picard and Data and, you know, and then everybody else. It was just opposite. It's all that's that's just kind of been amazing to me. So Nathaniel here said as a joke, there was a disturbance in the force on Vulcan. But it, it is it, it's kind of interesting how Spock has such empath, empathic connection that he was able to sense this. Boy, it's really hard for them to warp anywhere, isn't it? Warp speed is really difficult in the motion picture. Um, <laughs> We've got budget now, damn it, and we're going to show engineering. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's what's funny to me though is how that motion picture red alert light. <laughs> standard standard light show, engineer. Let's everybody go. uses it now. They put it. It's in Discovery. They put it in the corners. But that looks so. That was such an overkill thing at the time. I was like going, really, guys, really, we have to have this screaming Mimi red alert. Thing? I love. I, now, yeah. Larry, I just love how like the bridge changed to a color, and, and Kirk's like standard light engineer. This movie <laughs> will be beige. <laughs> this movie will be beige. Okay, <laughs> but it's it's really cool to see that Spock was able to sense this being, this entity, this logic uh, from so far away. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. were other Vulcans able to sense <clears throat> it, or is this unique to Spock being human and Vulcan, given given who he is and his background? That is, he he was able to make this connection with V'ger. I don't know. I don't know, Larry. I love how <clears throat> McCoy and Decker both, it's like the lean over the rail thing looks great from the front, but the minute you do a side view, it just looks like everybody suddenly got scoliosis. <laughs> <clears throat> the rail was too low to lean on, but that's all you had. You couldn't come down and lean on his chair arm. Have I said that again? What a wimpy chair it is. <laughs> Cause you can't lean on the arm and do the McCoy lean. This is I- the show where... Where where Kirk perfect where Shatner perfected the tiny little finger point move. He does it all the time. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. 
<clears throat> he did that McCoy. Huge. He did the card maneuver. That you thing is huge. The card I did. Yeah. But this kind of in 1970, this kind of stuff was like this is so great. The graphics and actually looked like they lived and worked and stuff worked. Now we have the beginning of the us versus the big blue cloud. So is this the sphere data? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. This is a this is a Dyson sphere. No, this is no. This is the Bohr Collective. No, 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 no. This is uh, the Prophets. Nope. Um, what is this? <laughs> well, so that's that's sort of a, a, a kid. But I'm I'm serious here. Where I'm glad. Um, this is, I think what what is so cool about this movie is you're wondering like, who are they? What are these aliens? Like we spent this whole time seeing the scale of the Enterprise, and then you just saw. Mm-hmm. This is where I think <clears throat> the th- theatrical cut arts, does yeah. fail a little bit. You don't get the scale comparison that well of the Enterprise to V'ger, it the scale is much better in the director's cut. Um, mm-hmm. But this thing is massive, and this whole time you're watching this movie, and you're thinking, what the heck is this thing? Now, we know it's V'ger, it's Voyager, it's a Voyager probe, but that idea, Larry, I think is so, it's just such a beautiful Star Trek mm-hmm. message that this probe that humanity just sent out in real life has gone, completed its mission, evolved, and is coming back now, and is this is this entity. I, I think it's such a hopeful vision of the future in a way that mm-hmm. only Star Trek can be. It's not Star Wars. It's not Space 1999. It's not Battlestar Galactica. That is an incredibly optimistic, that, uh, optimistic message that our probe has come back, and it's evolved. I love it. I love it, and I will defend this movie forever, for that reason, for the context of seeing this in that era, mm-hmm. I think it's phenomenal. We got a check off stream. Yay. Yeah, check off was yeah. <laughs> got, a, got a real hit, hit there. Yeah, you know, Spock feels much more Vulcan to me here than he does. Uh, well, he's been rejecting his human yeah, half, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until he does, he does the one eighty flip. There. Yeah, he really does. He's <laughs> quite different after he dies. I forget what this was. The Porta something that box. You could get the little. You could get a pack of ten prop pictures from Lincoln Enterprises, stuff that you couldn't see in the movie. And I just, yeah, it was cool to see how dinky they really were. But it, it was great. It's Bob. See, Dreams people forget how. that. <laughs> people forget that those those side consoles for Spock, some of the other stations had them, but mainly science, you know, that flat wall looking thing, but those pulled out, mm. which was a concept they, they, you know, in the D bridge, they had the consoles that pull out, the, like the AF stations. There was a few shows where you'd see Data back there working, maybe Wharf, but usually Data, and, and they had the little chair that pulled out, and the pullouts from the wall. Spock, transmit now. Charlotte says, I saw on... This is right out of the change lane, too. <laughs> um, look at that scale. Um, Charlotte says, I saw mm-hmm. on Facebook the other day that we'll lose contact with the Voyager probe in <coughs> 20... Bless you, in 2025. I was like, no worries. It'll be back in a couple centuries trying to destroy us and then merge with a human to create a new life form. Easy peasy. <laughs> and you'll know that it's... Uh, oh, here we go. You'll know it's... Um, you know, it's had a long voyage because it would have forgotten what number it was, and all of a sudden it won't be Voyager 1 or 2. It'll think it's Voyager 6. <laughs> I think it's a, uh, the Voyager probe mission in real life has been one of, I think, our greatest successes, the fact that we still have contact, mm-hmm. and it's still operating, and it's still sending back data, um, even though it has left our solar system, is, is amazing. And it's it's out there. It's out there, Larry, in interstellar space. Mm-hmm. I get those little Twitter alerts where it says, I am now 
12.6 or whatever it is, solar years away from. So um, while we're venturing through V'ger, Larry, um, mm -hmm. what was your impression of the motion picture when you saw it? Oh, we were excited. I mean, the first time we were all excited. I don't think – I think it took a while of reflection for people to have discipline. It was an – you know, the, part of it was we felt like – a lot of us felt like we had to go see it 82 times like all the Star Wars people had gone sure. to see Star Wars. Yeah. And I had seen Star Wars a lot, but it was like, okay, we finally got our movie. Now we have to go see it. And I remember like by the time – like a month or two later, it was still playing – in small theaters and my college town had it. And I, I remember the first time I went over and I fell asleep, like in the third act and I felt so guilty. <laughs> I'd had like a long day of class, and, you know, so we were, it was in between rehearsal, you know, we were in between shows or something. I just, I remember I had to wake myself up. I was like, Oh my God, I've only seen this three times or four times. And I'm already falling asleep in the third act. I was so guilty. <laughs> and then the more, the more the months went by we were kind of like okay okay so where's the explosion where's our publicity where's our goofy sure. stories about people standing in line around the block for yeah and it was kind of it wasn't like a, i hate star wars it was kind of like a, oh okay okay you were just a little disappointed but it was still you know but it was like okay gung-ho i'm gonna buy the action figures as soon as i get some money and uh but no, you know, me, I was more about, but like, oh, I had a photo novel. You know, I had everything you could get material wise and reference wise. Were there uh, much merchandise? I mean, Star Trek has so historically had a mixed you had the, You could get the little, there were the little plastic, they weren't Kenner, but the, you could get the little plastic figures. And there were some, see, there was a lot of merchandise that was planned and actually released. But the 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 customer base didn't blow. Everybody thought it would be Star Wars again, and when it didn't, some of the first things that were built they didn't make any. Like you could get really tall, really nice looking, either plushy or plastic like action figures of at least Kirk and Spock and I don't know Decker and whatever and Ilea, of course Ilea. But they they're so they're rare now because they didn't. There was no more demand, and they didn't keep making mm. them. And there was a lot of, you know, but, oh, I had the blueprints. They made special blueprints in the pouch again just for this. And you could see all the bridge stations. And, and it was blueprints for everything, the Klingon ship and the warp shuttle. And, you know, you could yeah. get those. <clears throat> it's, um... And space flight chronology. I mean, I had, I had all the books and magazines you could possibly get. I Not toys, not so much. So it's it's really, it's cool to hear your experience watching it. I mean, I, I felt some of the similar pressure of re-watching Star Trek 2009 a few times. Um, <laughs> I, I felt like I, I need to keep this thing, you know, Paramount has, has put a ton of money into rebooting Star Trek. I need to make sure it's a success. Yep. I, I think I, support the box I got to support, yeah. yeah, I think I watched it five times in the theater. Um, and... Uh, so I felt that pressure. I definitely get you about that. Um, what's interesting to me is that that comparison with Star Wars, um, because Star Wars is such a, it's a new hope episode four, and it was only called Star Wars back then. It's so Star Wars. It, I mean, it define it's like, it, and even it is paced slower than newer Star Wars films are. If you rewatch it. it, it also moves at that slower 70s pace, but it's so Star Wars and this movie, it's so Star Trek with the exception of the times it's trying to be Star Wars and, and wow us with the visuals. Like you don't need to wow us with the visuals, wow us with the ideas. It's kind of like when Discovery is just fine, except for when it's trying to be Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, you season one of yeah yeah well yeah what uh, yes of course that was yeah i mean you know none of the star trek films really feel like none of them really feel like an episode of star trek to me with the exception of maybe insurrection insurrection feels very much like a 
like an episode with uh, with a climactic action sequence in, in towards the end, space battle. Um, but I think where this this movie where it works is is a lot of the ideas. I think the ideas are really cool and and interesting. Mm-hmm. But then it spends a lot of time trying to like show us the 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 grand vision of the effects in the cinematography, which Robert Wise does so well. But if you're comparing this to Star Wars, boy, will it seem slow. Well, yes. And a lot of that is, you know, it's only four minutes difference and some of it is editing. But again, they were racing to get it out. They didn't cut back on the the visual effects. It wasn't just that they'd spent, you know, they they'd given up their first firstborn sons <laughs> to get the visual effects in time to do the show. So they didn't touch them. They didn't have time to touch them, much less feel like we just spent a billion on this. Now we can't touch it. And, but it should have been. And then yeah. that, that image just carried over. And now even when you watch the, the director's cut, you're expecting to still feel that way a little bit, or you're like totally keeping score. Okay. Am I feeling as bored now as I did the first time I saw, this? <laughs> you know, um, it's really the, um, I mean, if the lack of a palette got to you, then this whole thing about why did McCoy come on the bridge and then he left, there was a scene that was, that was more happening. I should cut it. So he, he kind of comes on the bridge and leaves. I should really, um, so we have commentary. This version of it has commentary mm-hmm. by, by the Akutas. Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens and um, Darren Docterman. Um, Darren Docterman, who the trio that redid the the redo in 2001, 2002, Darren was basically the visual effects that worked with Robert Wise. David Fine uh-huh. produced it. Mike Natasino was more about audio and, and the, the film, you know, the film upgrade and the audio upgrade and all that. And and Darren's the the version the four K they're doing right now the same team is doing it again. Of course, Robert Wise has passed. Well, but they're basically redoing all because they did it. They had the choice then, and they went with HD, not DVD. Right. And so right. they couldn't just upres everything easily when the next version came along, which was the stumbling block. But now they are. Right. Which is why I suppose this is not available. The director's edition is not available to. To stream because the stream I'm I'm seeing uh, I think this is for 4 K, um, but obviously things aren't scaled up yet with the director's edition. That makes a lot of sense why it's not available. But um, the reason I asked about the director's commentary is, um, gosh, I would uh, I'm sure these interviews exist. Probably you might know the answer to this question, Larry. But this seems much more influenced to me by 2001: A Space Odyssey. Than it does oh, yeah. uh, Star Wars. I think that's what I was saying. At the yeah. beginning. I mean, I kid about it now. It's like you know, it's like Robert Wise was up to date with the very latest from ten years earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. You know, not four years earlier. Right. Three years earlier. Right. Yeah, right. It's well, the Sound of Music is the same way. The Sound of Music is one of the best musicals, film musicals, and it's building upon all the musicals that kind of came before it on film, and it's really the ultimate version of it. This feels very much like a, um, if you could if you could do some of the 2001 A Space Odyssey, um, if you could do some of that with, with the modern effects, this is kind of what it would look Here like. Here we go. This is about, Peering Sulu was like, to me, act three. Sulu staring at the view screen. That's his view like, screen okay. ahead. <laughs> yeah, you're ahead. Oh, for a little bit of he's 500 miles from the planet killer in closing. I mean, that would have been so much. So we're we're I mean, starting to see to tell you the scale. You were supposed scale. to be getting a yeah. sense of the scale. Yeah. yeah, it's like I got the scale already. I got the scale already. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, this is the infamous part where it's like. Special effect model, yeah. reaction shot. Yeah. Special effect model, reaction shot. No, this is where the movie does really slow down. Um, now the the images are better here than they were in the. I mean, some of these some of these shots are a little bit better and they're redone from the from the uh, original. But there are pictures of people uh, 
some of the folks I uh, I can't. I just, oh, I've gone. Blind. I love this but view of Kirk. He was just dolls and things. All these parts of of V'ger that they were like racing around the clock to. You know, they're they're organic things. They're not Starfleet manufactured. I, all these organic parts of of V'ger that people were like you know, building in their shop and backyard and like hauling in and throwing together. To, anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna I, say, Larry, it was, uh, it was the camera cut to uh, Kirk reacting. And it was just Kirk like this, like <laughs> just, uh, the camera just held on it for a. Oh, we've got some action here. We've got a... uh, wait, wake up, everybody! <laughs> <Yeah>. Ah, <laughs> this is literally all through the. And even you know what that whole thing about the Tasha probe, even into the early part of filming motion picture, this was called the Tasha probe. It was like a holdover from the in thy image script. And they really, I mean, they. This was the one thing that Robert April did live. They actually had like a, a a light generator that's doing this effect, and it was on a mobile thing on wheels, and literally had an effects guy like wheel it around the corridor, and and that that's like the natural light that it gave off. But everybody was like half. When you see them doing this, it's all like for real. Absolutely, I will not. Don't worry. No one's interfering. No one's interfering, folks. It's okay. If only we could, like, assemble a humanoid bipedal body out of old model kits and aviator caps. <laughs> Don't touch the drone. It's not interested in us. Okay. You're watching Q. I thought You're he was supposed watching... to not interfere. That seems dangerous. <laughs> light bright making things with light. Out of sight smashing things with light bright. Hit it, Spock. Hit it. It's the blueprints. It's the franchise of blueprints. They're canon. <laughs> Here you go. There. Smash. Spock smash. I love how Spock just smash with all, all the logic in the universe. And it's the Starfleet karate chop that. Uh... We can't let it have our light brights. You know what I'm talking about when I say light brights. Yeah. Right? Oh, the I toilet. know. I know light brights. Yeah, yeah, okay. Of course, of That's course. what I was like. Really? They had all this money to spend, and they just put light brights on the console. And the security guy, very wisely, <laughs> does not draw down. Now this was this was pretty haunting. Well, this is this is the thing about this film that I I'm picking up here. Whoa. In the old drop tricorder, in the empty still bridge. Uh, that tricorder gives me a lot of next generation vibes. The the colors and the look of the buttons and looks very next generation. Um, Larry, this movie is is got some uh, some intensity to it. This this moment mm -hmm. here, the transporter accident. Um, unlike the original series, it it the. Space seems a lot more dangerous here. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking. As people are bringing up some good stuff in the chat. Um, Tony here is saying is points up that Doug Trumbull worked on motion picture. Um, worked on 2001 as well as oh. motion picture and the model work. Libby is remembering very much so the McDonald's. The first McDonald's offered Happy Meals like about a six months earlier, and the first licensed Happy Meal was for the motion picture. Huh. Really? The very new. first one? Yep. And there were like six boxes, I think. I've got two or three of them. Some people have the the box and the, the doodads inside. Yeah. There's a lot of belaying of orders here. <laughs> <laughs> and this was Shatner's wife at the time, Marcy mm. Lafferty. I'll do it if my wife gets a walk on. Three lines at least. Oh, and the, the railing is in front of her face when she has her line. Oh, well. Oh, gosh. There's a whole saga about all that activity on those view screens was all like eight millimeter loops with project, live projectors behind those screens. 
and they made up all of this footage and film with all those graphics and computer designs and all this stuff. And not only A, this is 1978 technology, not only did A, they go through their looping, they, you know, they do take after take in different angles and they would always be worried about where they were, you know, live projected and how they matched up and all that. But then they were also on these clattery projectors that made noise. Oh, gosh. And by the time they, they, they had prepared all this footage that they went through in a day or two and they needed more stuff. And they were they started contracting with some really early some of those graphics were pretty advanced you know some of the CGI patterns yeah. and things yeah were pretty advanced for the time and they made film loops of them they figured out a way to have the projector they muffled the silence a little bit but they were just a big pain and then by the time of Wrath of Khan they had gone to video and got rid of the actual projectors projecting they look you know, great the um as or they would run out of they would run out of film in the middle of a take and it would th- it suddenly would go blank as tim says even today these visual effects hold up very well uh and i'm watching the non-director's cut um it looks great like the effects look great everything looks great cut it a little bit more <laughs> let's move it along folks but um <laughs> it is the other thing I want to get back to, which makes us feel more Star Trek and more um, 2001. I start to, you're the psychologist. Aren't you supposed to be talking about brainy stuff? Yeah, we can talk about brainy stuff. Um, like I, I, let's talk about emotions here. And I, I think one of the thing that is really um, shining through here is is the awe and the the discovery of it all. Um, this, uh, you know, we often experience awe in the presence of something that might feel greater than us. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I think there's a spirituality to this film, this this connection to something grand, something big, um, that is so different than every other Star Trek movie is what makes the pacing feel so slow because we're seeing these characters in awe of this large thing that they don't know what it is. Like, I I think that is what this film is really, this film is so much about exploration and discovery. You know, and that's why it's so unfair to compare it to Wrath of Khan or Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Those films are about very different things. This is, this is about exploration and discovery and, and awe and, um, being um witnessing something you haven't seen before i am trying to yeah we haven't really there's never you know you might say that generations is half a movie about you know the dura sisters and the and that but the other half is about the nexus and exploring your inner self and the next as much as we make fun of the nexus having no parameters to it no limits and boundaries but yeah every other movie is well you've got you know an organic protagonist aside from the whale probe though i guess maybe star trek 4 star trek that turns into a time travel yeah yeah about travel about time travel you could you could argue maybe uh final frontiers about discovery a little bit um you know getting to the center of the galaxy maybe um I think I feel your pain. <laughs> I'll take your pain. I need my pain. <laughs> need it. Okay, okay. Keep your pain. Keep your pain. <laughs> oh, good. They fixed his light brights. <laughs> yeah. uh, kind of sort of. I think this is what makes it hard to to make this film um, to make a film that's purely about exploration. <laughs> It's another. I had never th- stopped to think. I mean, I kind of subtextually did, but I never start stopped to count all the the Shatner points in this movie. Oh, no, this is cool. another this is Shatner. Point. Another thing here of uh, this the sonic shower is birthed here. This is this was like all the birth of there's a of lot all the stuff that we couldn't do. We're gonna rethink our tech now because it's been ten years. Yeah, like why do they carry all that water around on a ship? That's pretty wasteful, and you know. Thing 
I love the play-by-play temperature update for the computer. I love the one button put a robe on her button there. See? Another shot in her point. Security guard carries the tricorder. I like that. Point. Another point. She didn't have the um, diode here before, right? This is... Yeah, no, that's the feature. Yeah. That's the camera sensor thingy thing that shows its feature. It's the ILEA probe, yeah. Right. Ah, security guy gets a line. Ush. Did this? Are you watching? Did the security guy just have his line? Yeah. Vincent Perez. Yeah. We're pretty synced. Yeah, we're pretty close. I'm at twenty four twenty nine as I say this. And I am at Mut- one hour twenty one minutes fifty eight seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, one hour twenty four. Mark. We ever do a. Uh, theme of circular logic you just play this scene this is one of the one from my mud <laughs> were you onto this at was anyone onto this while they were watching that V'ger is Voyager you know it's what's sad is I can't remember I think the novelization. I think so. I think the the if you cared to know, you could get into it. I think the novelization. I don't. I do remember that. I think the novelization for this and for Star Trek Two were both on sale before the movies open. You could like go read the novelization. Oh, this is the picture that was like in every promo everywhere. This, the scan. It was. This was very cool. How they had the see the shadow bar over her is. The shadow scan line that's reflecting. The yeah, other, yeah, that's other cool. Other. So someone, yeah. someone mentioned earlier. Let me see if I can dig up the comment. Um, that yeah. wall of octagons behind winds up being used in other sets all the time. I think. Later. I think Nathaniel's got a great question here. How do Vo- uh, V'ger and the Ilea probe compare to Data or the Picard Golem? I think that's a cool thing for us to discuss here. So Ilea. Ilea seems like she's a probe that doesn't... Larry, wake up! Wake up! We got a lot oh, more okay. of this movie to go. <laughs> um, Ilea is, is is a probe that I think has the, the, least of, the least amount of agency, awareness, compared to Data or, or Picard. I think Picard... Uh, mm-hmm. Data... Data, as we see him towards the end... Um, is is pretty human like um and picard's golem is very indistinguishable i think from from humans although now we know from discovery that the technology rarely worked well um minus picard how lucky it was that it turned out so good for picard (laughs) considering he had an agent and a big contract and everything it was really lucky (laughs) you know I know we're jump, I'm jumping the timeline here, Larry. Um, it's been a while since we've talked about Discovery, and boy, am I loving the season. Um, the season is mm-hmm. um, is just really lovely for so many so many reasons. Um, it's like the pandemic slowed down everything to the point where it was like Star Trek again. Yeah, and it's great to see our lovely doctor doing so much medicine, but also therapy. Um, I was gonna. I've been wanting to ask you about that. Yes, he's yeah. the first like dual threat since McCoy on that. I, I and I I'm here for it. I love it. It's I've got a lot of thoughts about it. I'm really looking forward to talking Discovery again when we uh, when we get there. Um, Nathaniel says uh, the newer series do push AI more to the fore. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. It, you know, for in that in those uh, those wandering years when we had no new Star Trek on TV, 
one of the things that I would often criticize Star Trek for is really dropping the boat when it comes to AI and cybernetics. And well, I guess they've picked that up. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here's those old Enterprises. Yeah. There's the memorial wall, and it's and it's the old great star foam cup of coffee, or I suppose. Yeah, no, and an X here. Oh, you forget. You know what? I forget that there's two security guards over there at the side. Somehow, I like that never registered on me till just now that there's two security guards watching them. Larry, uh, the carbon units use this area for recreation. Look how much fun that room looks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is. <laughs> This was a big improvement over Pong. Come on. Doom. 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 I guess. Doom. I guess. I think they need like a basketball court or something. Uh, uh, hey, this is strong enough that any minute now, Kirk is going to pound the table slightly. Uh, Livy says discovery stands not just for discovery of aliens and new civilizations, but also discovery of oneself. It means so much more to so many representation. Yeah, I, I well said, Livy, that um, the show's really come into its own with season um, two, three, and four. But I think especially season three and four, it's really discovered what it is. Mm hmm. It's it's comfortable in its own skin. It's figured out what it should have been all along. But I, I, I'm about to decide that Discovery is always going to be the – sometimes the oldest kid in the family is the one that benefits them. There it is. Bang. It's his little knuckle wrap. Um, it's, sometimes the oldest kid in the family benefits the most from being the oldest, and sometimes the oldest kid is kind of like the sacrificial kid. <laughs> and the ones that follow are a little more better adjusted. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too – layman cycle babble there but discovery to me is the case of the oldest kid not getting the beneficiary of mm. like next generation was the oldest kid of the berman family and maybe it its first couple of see i don't know i'm probably talking at my wazoo here but i just think discovery suffered from such a huge gap of time and such a huge chaotic birth and then it did settle down, but it's like I almost expect every year to have a different tone and flavor as it goes along. Yeah, but I think, and that's why I think with season three and four, we've we've kind of it's kind of settled settled in. Yeah, um, but it took four a few. even more. I can tell a tone difference between four and three. Yeah. Oh look, it's yeah. airlock suits. Yay! Um, getting actual getting back to um, the motion picture here. Um, Linda says, "Jesus, Shat, Harry! Interesting. They gave him short sleeves. They wax all that hair off for TOS. I think this just reflects um, the the style of the decade. Hair the times, yeah. Hair was very much in in um, in the seventies. Um, and Star leaders with mustaches. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, so I think that's just more reflective of that. Unlike." Um, Unlike the rest of the films, um, going from Wrath of Khan all the way... Gosh, even that title sounds so much more energetic than the motion picture. <laughs> like, <gasps> moving images versus the Wrath of God. Uh, but, well, uh, you know, if you're standing there in 1979 and someone says, I'm going to go see a Star Trek movie. Like, what they do? I could go see Star Trek in a big screen, too. No, we're not going to show episodes. This is a new movie. So it was like, it's not Star Trek, the TV series in a theater. It's Star Trek, the motion picture. The motion picture. picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, but you can't call the, you know, then if you do another movie, you can't call it Star Trek, another motion picture. That See, that doesn't work. The motion picture, too. Um, the motion picture. Sure, again, but different. Yeah, yeah, Linda. What you see with the the body hair here, here, you see that with um, uh, you see that with uh, bones too. Um, um, mm -hmm. but but also with uh, so looking at Wrath of Khan forward to uh, um to the Kelvin timeline, it it really seems like a lot of the other films try to have um. Actually, I should take that back about the Kelvin timeline. Maybe from Wrath of Khan to Nemesis, they they appear to be more, a little bit less of the era that, that they're in. They seemed a little bit more timeless. I think the, the Kelvin timeline that took a lot of the costuming was more reflective of our modern era. Um, 
But I would say the Kelvin movies and motion picture probably feel the most of the time in which they were they were made. Um, I know all every time I see all the militarism of the uniform, the mar, you know as much as everybody loves the monster maroons, all the detailed braid and gold and all that just it always screams the Reagan eighties to me. It's like you know so militaristic and as a contrast to the sixties and seventies that had been before. But, this uh, scene, yeah. Larry, feels so two thousand one. This is. Mm -hmm. um, Infinite and Beyond, let's go meet the star child. This is very, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm surprised the computer is saying, I'm sorry, I can't do that, Spock. <laughs> but it was so cool to have controls with labels on them. Can I just also say that <laughs> after everything in the original series, having gibberish, you know, and G and D in and just all the all the marbles and the Christmas lights. It was so cool to see all this graphic and text work and everything. And <laughs> I always love this. This is, but see, nothing has helped. Has, nothing has improved since Doomsday Machine. Sir, someone's launching a shuttlecraft. What? Nobody was on duty in the hangar deck. This still like, happens. It's still yeah. people take Star uh, Shuttlecraft. Now Spock all did nerve pinch the one guy on duty, so you know there is that. But still, look, there's the there's there's the Kirk point. I did not I didn't remember to think of how many times he does that little pointy gesture. Now this is this. Oh, here in a minute will be the scene at the end. I want to see if they cleaned up the uh, scene. I remember when they used it in the TV. I'll say this now: the TV. Oh, I love that. See, all that stuff is so cool. It was so simple and so obvious, but it was so cool to see in Star Trek. Um, on the TV version that they showed about eighty two or eighty three, they put they were putting in footage and they were it's kind of like bonus features on a DVD. Said, Look, it's got extra minutes in the TV version, and Shatner comes out to grab him in his spacesuit when he's floating. But it was a shot they didn't finish, and you see him come out the airlock. But if you looked up, you could see the studio rafters, like where the pylon of the ship was. And then instead of being black space, you could see the the rafters in the soundstage. And it was so obvious. And then when they, at least one of the versions, they used that exact same thing again and didn't change it. And I'm like, what? What happened? Rose is asking, how come it's, uh, w is it nighttime where I'm at? No, Rose, I just haven't uh, turned on the additional lights here. Uh, <laughs> giving me a little bit more cinematic view of the motion picture here. Um, this is when Spock went to explore Telstar. Oh, I'm sorry. The, like the first communications. This always reminded me of like the first communications satellite that you would. Oh, yeah. Live via Telstar. OK, I'm showing my age. Da, I love this music cue. Da. I should say about the, um, the speaking of the music, um, the only issue with the Klingon theme is uh, depending on whether you saw the movie Alien first or the motion picture first, um, those two themes sound very similar. So are the Klingons coming or are the xenomorphs coming? Um, it probably depends on what you saw first. I don't remember that. Wow. You mean the dum 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 jump 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 jump. Listen, Do they have listen to them? Are there wooden sticks in the aliens? Look, it's Darth Vader. Oh, wait. No. <laughs> Everything is so symmetrical in this V'ger approach. Uh, to Char Charlotte said, Ollie's got the window closed to hide that hide from that squirrel uh, the squirrel has not bothered me although i still see it around um i should say it's in it's it's raining heavily in northern california it's been oh, it raining is. for a long time so it is uh there's not a lot of sunlight coming in uh which is good we need the rain uh, we really need need the rain over here this was cool then before it became the boar go-to prop thing the little doll that's the little doll figure the little action figure coming up like that but they raised it this was pretty amazing. 
I will attempt to mind meld with it. He's just like, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm just gonna, gonna watch. I'm gonna meld with this thing. Okay, see, they've cropped in. They have a much closer close up on Kirk when he was. They show him first exiting the airlock, and you could that's where you could see the rafters because they hadn't, they didn't finish getting the uh, visual effects fixed. It's kind of interesting to think. So this is also a, um, um, I, I think a sci-fi idea that goes back. It's on wires. Yeah. This this idea of usually a uh, a person becoming more intelligent, but here we have a probe with very basic programming: collect information, send it back to Earth. Like mm -hmm. if you evolve that very basic programming you can see how this would happen and and this it makes it reminds me of other sci-fi stories like flowers flowers for algeron one of my uh the first science fiction uh stories i ever uh read um which is about what what happens when you do increase intelligence artificially increase intelligence what happens and i think these are some of the consequences the unintended mm. consequences of technology just to tie it to our present day one of the biggest problems we have right now in tech is when uh, our AI is very, very basic. It's, it's, you can teach it to do very basic things, um, to learn basics about data set and then release it to, to, to do some very, very basic stuff about relationships. The problems often happen when we let AI m independently make decisions without us sort of monitoring. Um, what decisions are, are being made over there. And I, I think that idea of unintended consequences of releasing technology into the wild and not really having um, much oversight, much control of it, it's it's part of the, I, I would say, the commentary here on the motion picture, and it very much applies to, to today as well. Mm -hmm. And can I just say that I love... That collar, it always reminded me of the Mercury astronaut's original space suit when you'd see Alan oh, Shepard yeah. jump with the orange lining for the body sensor layer or whatever that's supposed to be. Not to take away from the depth of what you were talking about, but that just... No, no, I love that. This is what makes our watch along so cool. What are we going to talk about? I don't know. Um, we'll be seeing AI yes. monitor independently like on Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. Like our algorithms that are that are driving what we watch, um, algorithms mm -hmm. that are driving what we purchase, um, that are shaping our decision making. Uh, absolutely. Um, there are big consequences to releasing technology into the wild. And that's what the motion picture part of the message here, the motion picture. Ah, oh, man, I really love those watches. <laughs> they look so cool. Risk communicators. Risk communicators. Okay. Risk com I looks a lot better than my wrist communicator, I'll tell you that. They always did remind me of the, the old Dick Tracy ones, though, mm. so it didn't feel too futuristic. It always bugged me in the scene that McCoy mm. has no lines. Is this all that I am? Is there nothing more? Mm -hmm. It is a pretty cool mystery here. And I love that this movie, the antagonist is a being that we created that is trying to search for a higher level of existence. This is Star Trek, folks. This is, this, this is Star Trek. This is, this is Encounter. This is a new. This is a new uh, director's edition thing because that shape was always like planned, but you never saw the entire. That's what you've spent two hours driving through the length of, and you finally see it in scale because they show it over Earth. The cloud it generates is huge, the energy cloud, but the actual core of V'ger itself is is that torpedo-looking thing, and you didn't get that in the theater. Because you wanted to see it in scale, no, which, which I am not seeing in my cut. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. But that that is one of the that was one of the final reveals of the director's edition that was so rewarding was to finally mm -hmm. see that scale. Yeah.
the scale that I'm seeing is not. But it was only for like <laughs> three or four or five seconds. Yeah. But yeah, so a being searching for its creator, asking, you know, is there anything more to my existence? These are such human questions of of internal discovery. Um, mm -hmm. And it just, these are all the things that, to me, define Star Trek. Star Trek is about what's out there, but it's also about what's in here. And in here, Spock. <laughs> This simple feeling, yeah. Hey, Tim, uh, Tim Hans mentioned uh, something I should have said back there. The whole V'ger spacewalk scene was a replacement for this memory wall scene that they tried to film. It's a little bit like Troy inside the Farpoint alien in Next Generation. They they had this whole elaborate thing set up where memory crystals of V'ger attack Kirk and Spock like it's an like it's an antibody attacking an invader. And they just couldn't film it. They had this trench, mm. and they had wires, and it was all this work, and it just looked horrible. And it didn't work, and it was you know pre-CGI. It all had to be analog, and they scrapped it and went with that. It was you know Spock in the suit, and um, it's all visual effects. They just have to build all those damn models now and do it. But they did it, barely. Uh, I agree with Tim. He says, uh, I will defend this movie to my last breath. I, I agree with you, Tim. I just love how bold and different this film is. Um, now, Larry, how did it do at the box office? Well, it did. I don't. It, I don't have the exact number here, but I, I want to say it made 144 million originally. That number just popped in my head, but yeah. it was the high. It was actually the highest grossing movie until '09, when you were on a wholly different, you know, plateau and scale. It actually outperformed. Um, and I want to double check that with, I'm, I'm with check, domestic yeah. versus, the, and there's domestic versus. But everybody always thinks of Wrath of Khan, you know, that's more like it, and all of that, and Star Trek Four being globally big. But the 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 irony for years and years and years and years was, and it's part of it's because it was the first movie you had the pent up demand of ten years, and you had everybody running around going to see it four and five and six times. Because you felt duty bound to do it, you know, we have to go do that. So I'm looking at the uh, according to Box Office Mojo, uh, the budget for this was 35 million, um, and the initial take was 82 million. Um, uh, let me see if I can get a, a franchise comparison here. I've had a I've had a chart at times somewhere. Let's we do. We're back into McCoy Goodline territory here. They're talking. It's a tr it's a trio. It's the triumvirate talking here. So come only now we've got four in the huddle instead of three. So yeah, um, it looks like well the voyage home. Made a hundred and nine million, which exceeded the motion picture, um, and then uh, it, it wasn't until First Contact that we had a Next Generation movie that made more than the motion picture at ninety two million, mm -hmm. and um, the Voyage Home and, and motion picture were the highest grossing until we got to the Kelvin timeline, which is a very different scale of marketing, which all. I well, look at the budget too. I found yeah, the budgets are, are are way bigger once we got to um, Star Trek two thousand nine Into Darkness and beyond. Um, so it's questionable which movie was was more profitable. Um, but the Wrath of Khan, my goodness, twelve million dollars, twelve million. It was a TV movie. They started off doing it like a TV movie. It was a yeah. fraction of motion pictures. 35 million and it earned nearly as much so well unfairly we're a little ways away from the movie here but unfairly don't forget that the motion picture everything that from the 70s the planet of the titans development the phase two all the sets they built and the scripts they paid for for phase two um everything that had ever been paid out through the 70s got lumped onto the motion picture so 
Right. And there were rewrites and overruns right. and the special effects debacle and all of that did, you know, and everybody working 24 seven for six months to get the right. visual effects finished. So they could ship the prints out wet. And Robert Wise carried the one print of the completed movie to to Washington, D.C. for the celebrity premiere. Oh, my God. So all that was true. Oh but it gosh. also got dumped on every all the mishigosh <laughs> of the 70s got dumped on it. So they blamed which they blamed on Gene, which wasn't all of his doing. So. Do you remember where the motion picture premiere was? Um, I think I lived when I lived in. It was in D.C. at a neighborhood at, at theater. At the Uptown in the Theater. It was at the Aaron Space. I think it was at the Uptown Theater in Washington, D.C. I lived really close by that theater when I lived in Washington, D.C. Obviously, that was much later in time. Uh, but it's, our, it's all. Yeah. I've been to that theater many times, and now I, I think it's gone now. But um, I think they proudly showed. There was a poster that said, you know, the site of the world premiere of the motion, Star Trek, the motion picture. Let me confirm this if I can. I'm pretty sure. Okay. You, know, you do know the movie's going on. The movie is going on. I know. I know. This is time for the big Ilea point moment. Got to get the framing. Here we go. Got to get the frame with the view screen. Okay. She can't overlap the mat. Oh, Uhura grabs uh, Sulu in awe and fear. This is back when you could block a turbo lift with enough bodies. No, I misremembered, Larry. It was a different movie theater. It was the uh, the KB Theater mm -hmm. uh, where the premiere happened. I think the movie theater I'm thinking of, it, it had the premiere for like Alien or something else. You're going way too local there, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gray for security and tactical, by the way, on those patches. Yeah, so. Oh, Zaheer tells me that the theater I'm thinking about is... Uh, negotiating to reopen the Uptown Theater. I think Zaheer might be the only person interested in this Washington, D.C., inside the Beltway movie theater the trivia. Yeah. <laughs> At the moment. All right, back to the film here. Because we're, you know, right here. A lot of chest hair is featured in this movie. We, Check we, off. People are talking about how her suit... I forget to talk about... Yeah, the 70s were long hair and mustaches and... This was added for the directors in the TV edition. This whole self-destruct thing. Yeah, I'm not seeing that either. And that much matter in every matter of logic. Oh yes, we will indeed. So and I want to say it's a newish one too. Yeah. Yeah, no. Where I'm at in this movie, in the director's or the theatrical cut, they're forming an oxygen envelope around the Enterprise. Oh, you're a little, yeah, I'm, there's, there's a pan here that establishes how they're letting Starfleet know. They're all thinking it's a countdown to doom around Earth. For those, you're, you're, for, you're about, you're about to step out on the. Thing, yeah, I right? think so. Uh, I am for all those keeping score on Paramount Plus. I am at one hour, 49 minutes and 49 seconds. Um, I think this is where a lot of the. Four minutes comes in. Yeah, this I'm at is, one, yeah. Two. There's a there's a huge pan back and forth around the bridge of everybody dealing with impending doom in their own way. They're either relaying reports with Earth and Starfleet or whatever. They just did a big master pan, got everybody, including Marcy Lafferty, including Chief DeFalco, and the whole DeFalco family. And the Spock tier is just now happening. Which I think the original cut you cut right to the tier without having the big pan and all the build up to it or the second ah, tier. There's the tier in sick bay. And Larry, I've, I figured out why I was misremembering. 
Star, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey premiered at the Uptown Theater in Washington, <laughs> D.C., which reminds me of the motion picture. So for all the Washingtonians, that's what was going on. For all of them. Okay. Uh, for Zaheer. <laughs> Blast it, Ali. No one cares about the damn theater. <laughs> um, Larry, the um, those little steps outside the Enterprise leading to, mm. to the Voyager probe, I think they look gorgeous. I don't know what the effect is. How they they might be just styrofoam blocks. I don't know what what those are, but they look do you great. Mean as a production, or do you mean yeah, as uh, a production? Like the the action those those steps. I think they look they look otherworldly and very synthetic, um, very geometric. They look it looks beautiful. However, they did that. They had to that, and then when they eventually make the the V'ger bowl, yeah, you know. There were there were certain of those that were reinforced. To, every once in a while, somebody would forget and step on one that wasn't reinforced and like, ooh, you know, fall through. It was, but it, I mean, it was like you would kind of get ooh, maybe high water or something. Here, but you would, here it is wedgie. in my version: the camera slowly revealing Voyager, not seventy four sixty five six or whatever, but the mm-hmm. Voyager probe. Voyager, Voyager. <laughs> The finger point. <laughs> yeah. I'm not like where stopped. There okay, I'm at the finger now. See? She can't raise her finger above the frame of the Is that where you were? Yeah, I just saw that. Oh, somehow we got back together. Yeah, I always loved that. Oh look, she can't raise her finger over the scope of the It'd have to be matted around. They'd have to do a traveling mat around her finger. This was so much better in the director's edition, just the look of it. Because you actually see the little things kind of crystallizing and forming, the steps. Charlotte asking is asking me to let it go with the Washingtonian stuff. Um, <laughs> Charlotte, be very careful when you ask a father of a young girl to let it go, because that might trigger other other singing. <laughs> I love. Oh yeah, the late seventies for Chester. Yeah. I mm-hmm. love how there's dust covering um, the the name. Like this is a I, I don't know. There's yeah, an interesting dust. there's an interesting thing here. Like how did that get there? You know. Mm-hmm. And like, does a Voyager probe look at itself and it sees the dust and goes, "I guess my name's Voyager." <laughs> like w- what? I'm sa- I'm sorry, but the uh, yeah the uh, the creation of the see in the director's edition just for everybody the the walking pods the little tiles that pop up that the, first they come in like uh, organic spots and then in the movie in the original movie it was like this wide field and in the but in the uh, director's edition they're only about. They're only about five yards, eight yards across. It's like it's much narrower. And to me, it gives a lot more feeling of tension than it does when they're when it was like just this wide thing that came up to the hull. And they show them walking on a bridge, almost like, you know, it's like the bridge on the River Kwai or something or the bridges at Toko. It's like this, you know, the jungly hanging bridge that's that just creates tension by crossing. You know, somebody's going to fall through and you got that more with with the second do on it. So I, I think this is so cool because this is, you know, they're talking mm-hmm. about the Voyager was launched over 300 years ago. This movie came out oh, two back. years after know. the Voyager probes were out. Mm-hmm. I mean, just how cool is this? Yep. The Voyager's la- the Voyager probes launched uh, Carter's years. So, yeah, the set, the late 70s. And so the early late 70s. So they. They borrowed a model from NASA, like the oh, backup really? model. That, yeah. So this is so it landed on the other side of the galaxy to a machine civilization 
that found it to be a simpler form of its own, you know, another, a kindred spirit, repaired it, whatever, to help it complete its mission. Larry did it encounter the Borg. That is what we're wondering. Well, that was the, the kudos of said Gene would joke about that. I, it may be, I, I may have seen a memo where somebody said something about that. Like by the time of Q Who and the Borg created, because the Borg were created only, you know, you think about that 87, 88, 88, 89, 88, 79. It was only eight, nine years later that the Borg were created. Mm hmm. That but, next gen was running. So I don't know how I feel about this theory. I think it's a fun theory, but the Borg are cybernetic. They're not. Um, they're not a synthetic life form. So now, I don't know my Borg history very well. Were the Borg once? Did they combine? Did they assimilate a synthetic race and become cybernetic? Um, because if that's the case, then I could totally see the Borg and V'ger having a, some kind of similar ancestry. The uh, the canon background of the Borg has never been like the origins. Like, who were the first species to come together or be assimilated, or where did that? Yeah, where did the cyber? Where did the techno industrial, not organic part of the Borg come from? Has never really been totally. I'm kind of surprised that Voyager never gave us the those answers uh, yeah. to to the Borgs or a movie or yeah. a big you know movie head. Which, but that's cool. That's I can we please have some things left unexplored in <laughs> Star Trek? So here's my head canon. Then <clears throat> here's what I'm going with: texture, not trivia, mm -hmm. Larry. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I, I'm going to believe here that the Voyager probe encountered the same species that the Borg might have assimilated. The first species. About Voyager 6. Yes, this Voyager 6. It had probably encountered that, that same species that the Borg assimilated and formed the original collective. Um, but that species, I don't think, was destroyed. That synthetic species wasn't destroyed when the Borg assimilated them. The Borg just assimilated them, and, and, and that's kind of how they became cybernetic. So I think somewhere out there in that great unexplored universe is this synthetic race that is probably the progenitors of both the Borg and Voyager. And V'ger, I should say. And, and Nomad. <laughs> the people that launched Tanru, which was the probe that merged with Nomad to become, yeah, what it became. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that happened way back when. The Iconians, there's these grand civilizations, the... Sphere data, whoever built that Dyson sphere. Yeah. There's so much stuff out there that um, I think we have plenty of room for these. Well, no spoilers there on Discovery, but now that you know that the dark matter anomaly is extra galactic, it's like what people are jumping on the Kelvins, and I, it's like, well, what about the people that built the Doomsday Machine? You know, just yeah. because they didn't get a name, a proper name. See all those wacky panels in the flooring and those light. Yeah, that was all a thing that once a day maybe somebody would they would you know mark them or whatever. And <laughs> once a day maybe somebody would step on one and fall not fall through like ah but like you know get high fived. <laughs> yeah, Charlotte says I feel like the Borg would have just assimilated it, it or um, would have started making their way to Sector Zero Zero One way before cling, uh, Q, before Q cl uh, slingshot the Enterprise D into the Delta Quadrant. So I I agree with this. Um, I think if if the Borg encountered V'ger, they would have just assimilated it, learned about Earth. So that's why I think they encountered that that same species that the Borg probably assimilated way long ago. Um, Cairo says the Borg were probably created by tentacle monsters of Picard, and those were also the guys that reformed uh, V'ger 6, and that's why the Borg knew that USS Voyager by name when it arrived in the Delta Quadrant. There you go. Simple. Thank you, Cairo. Tied it up. I love. I've forgotten how the light changes. The all the vo all these things in the V'ger bowl scenes, they're like, there's like ambient light, and then it goes cold blue, and then it goes lavender. It's like the ghost of Jerry Fitterman is like lighting this. Like V'ger is going through moods, and the moods are, you know, it's like angry alert or <laughs> calm alert. 
And now we're going back to, oh, now we've got a green tone. Okay. We've gone, you know. You know, if Vidra wanted to join with a human, it should have picked a human instead of Ilya earlier. I think that would have solved most of this movie. Um, mm -hmm. Mike says, my theory, the Borg are enhanced clones from the Clone Wars. Due to the replicant fading, they had to assimilate some new DNA, the Borg and the Empire, both like big geometric shapes for their ships. Uh, QED. Uh, well, okay. that crosses the streams. I'm a little behind here, but you got so Tony and Dave Gregory are talking about Giants Causeway. That is that that's a geographical formation? Okay, now we're back in lavender mode here. Charlotte says I didn't realize I was an actual NASA model. I also didn't realize that the Voyager probes were so big. I've always wondered why we haven't sent out more Voyager probes different directions. I guess... Well, that was... Yeah, somebody... I was going to say this. Uh, uh, yeah, Linda pointed this out. There was, only, there was only Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, which is why it was safe for them to call this Voyager 6. There was a time there where they... You know, the the 70s, we were getting big enough to send these and, and big-minded enough to send these space probes out, but we didn't have the budget... Things were analog, and now they now they're sending out leaner, meaner machines, and the power and all of that stuff can be miniaturized. But back then they would build two of everything. They would basically like Voyager and what was the other one? Um, Mariner. Pioneer. Oh, Pioneer, Pioneer and Mariner. Now some of the early like Mariner was a was a program that was meant to look at what Mars and and uh, what was the one that went to Venus? Viking, but anyway, uh, Viking also. Viking was for Mars. Yeah. Uh, but they're, I mean, on the 60s, but Pioneer and uh, Voyager were meant to be like long range probes, and there were two and two. It was basically like if one of them failed, then there would at least have two out there. Yeah. If we had two, you know, but like, but three, it's kind of like three is too many. Yeah, 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 I see. <laughs> one is it's, not enough, two is just right, kind of a thing. A little redundancy is and good. Uh, more than that is uh, is a lot of money. It reminds me of that, that great line from Contact. Um, why build one when you can build two for twice the cost? <laughs> uh, All right, we are seeing the birth of a new life form here. Again, this is so Star Trek. Bear witness new life. Are you in? You're into the blinding light moments, huh? Yes, uh, I'm. I'm into the Star Child moment. <laughs> yeah, the Star Child moments. The the system they were using for that did its job really well. They, uh, it, was, it was like some of them had retina damage from the bright light on set. Wow. And in my yeah, moment, the whole thing about the Voyager. Huh? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Larry. I said the whole thing about Voyager Six. I was sitting there because this had all been in the news, even if you weren't a science nerd. Space nerd. It was it had just been in the news for the two and three years before, and it was you know as it went as the pioneers and voyagers both went out of the solar system, they were taking the best pictures ever of Jupiter and Saturn and and all that. And but that was taking years to get to each planet. But even then, we were like Voyager six. Well, that was a safe Star Trek. You know, that that's like calling something Apollo twenty. Right. You know, it's like right. oh okay. Well, there's the safe thing. We'll never have that. Which, if you see For All Mankind, I think we get to Apollo mm -hmm. 70s right. or something. Um, in Lali, that. Lali, you do know that For All Mankind is alternate future history. What? It's, it's not real. I know. There's no moon base? There's no Soviet Union in the, <laughs> in the 2000s. I'll say, if anyone <laughs> is looking for a great sci-fi show to watch... For All Mankind is, is fantastic. Ron Moore produced show. Mm -hmm. It has one of the most phenomenal season two finales. It, it, it is just an amazing yep. hour of TV. It's, it's Way better than Shades of Grey. Um, good stuff. Which was a season two finale. Of me. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Akutas worked on For All Mankind. Steve Oster, who was a line producer on DS9, worked on for all mankind there were some several trek people that worked on it because ron wanted them to work on it 
<clears throat> Shall we give the Enterprise a proper shake that? Yeah. Should have probably done that a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only time Scotty's on the bridge almost in the whole show. Yeah. He finally gets up to the bridge. I mean, I'm All still right. back in the world's most powerful hair blow dryer in the world's <laughs> most powerful lighting system moment. So so, oh, see lens flares all over the place here. What are they criticizing JJ for? I just, uh, yeah, I know, right? I saw um, my okay. moment just ended with Kirk saying warp one ahead that way. Shouldn't they, like, reconnect with Starfleet before, like, leaving? They're right here at Earth. They just, like, like rediscovered the Voyager probe. A new species, a new life form has evaporated into the cosmos Maybe talk to someone about this at uh, at Earth. I think I think someone would be interested. Captain Kirk, you and your crew have just saved Earth. Where are you going first? <laughs> oh, we're we're going that away. <laughs> Forget <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> Disney Planet. Oh, Disney Planet would definitely be. Uh... The human Ooh. adventure is just beginning, Larry. I do love that line. We told, I we love told, it's a great, it's a great tagline. It's a great, yeah. I that, didn't. That was I all did, over the marketing, right? Uh, the posters mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. Oh, that was that had been that, that had been the marketing for ages. We're not showing them the new Enterprise. We're not sure. It was just like blacks, <laughs> like starry things, and the human adventure is just beginning. And in Paramount Plus's infinite, infinitely intelligent algorithm. It's now recommending that I watch Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock next instead of The Wrath of Khan. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I don't know. Is The Wrath of Khan on Paramount Plus? The way it's <laughs> such, such I think, gibberish. I think so. I think so. What's happening in the director's cut, Larry? I it McCoy. They just got back on the bridge and they're having their happy talk for the tag ending. I'm waiting for the blooper because orange is science and green is medical, and they're in their away jackets. Yes. First time since the cage. And I'm waiting for the one angle when you see that they've switched, they've accidentally switched jackets and McCoy has an orange ring and Spock has I, the green ring. I did notice that. I was going to, I was going to. Uh, I remember I saw that in the theater. The, the first or second time I saw the movie, I'm like, did they, have they got the wrong, in that one shot, did they have the wrong colors on? Mike is saying, uh, did we just witness the birth of the Q I mean, who knows? We never see or hear from this life form again, or do we? Did we just witness the birth of a new franchise? <laughs> Film franchise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this scene of let's get everybody who has barely been on the bridge, get them on the bridge for the tag shot, for the pullback. I think it's the final full pullback when they, uh, yes, the final pullback is when they've got the switch jackets. So Tim says, will we ever get to see the Decker um, uh, Ilya life form ever again in Star Trek? Uh, I think if there's a series that will give us this, this life form again, it's Lower Decks. Oh, or Discovery, maybe. One of these wacky doodle potentialities Viger Decker or Ilya Decker or the Doomsday Machine Builders or something maybe um, maybe what's behind the DMA which uh, I the always one want to say DCA and the DGA the one thing <laughs> the I don't DMA. like about the DMA is I always want to say DNA um, yeah that too I think that acronym that's the one thing I'll fault season 3 4 so far <laughs> Libby says with Paramount Plus, who knows what you will see. <laughs> it's so true. It is so true. Um, and, and we're all talking about uh, Americans saying that. Yeah. All of our overseas friends are just kind of like, okay, fine. Well, with that sound I hear in yours, Larry, you're, you're, the yep. director's cut has come to an end. and I'm laughing here that the first two names in the titles are John Dykstra and Doug Trumbull. <laughs> It's like all visual effects people that save the damn thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that was that was really cool. Um, I'm really glad we did that. I, I think there's. Um, I don't know if we added. Do we add anything to the discourse about this movie? I don't know. I was just kind of going on, you know, whatever. Uh, Hope everybody 
enjoyed that, though. Yeah, I hope folks enjoyed that. It oh, was I forget fun. Dee Neal was on the makeup crew for this. Wow. Okay. Um, Tim says Voyager was going to do an episode with what happened with that life form, but it was dropped. Um, I can see that happening with with a lot of these series is uh, uh, like ah, we should we should pick up that storyline nah maybe not <laughs> too big to touch too big yeah but I um, no I really enjoyed this I, I think um, there's some watching this again with you Larry there's a lot more I, I learned about um, how this fits into the larger voyage of Star Trek but I also never picked up on um some of the messages it has about technology and how that, seeing that from a 2021 perspective, I, I think it's pretty cool for the few days that we have left in this year, uh, 2021. Um, Tim says, that was a brilliant watch. Thanks for the watch along. Uh, thank you, Tim, for being here. Thank you to all of our folks for being here. Larry, we <laughs> we will be back. Tony's calling us the Larry unit and the Ali unit. But yeah. <laughs> I love that. I'm happy to be your life support live units here. Sure, turn down the noise before we get uh, hit down on the. Yeah. So, Larry, we're going to be. Noise. We're going to be back on Saturday, January eighth. We'll be back to talk Star Trek Discovery. Um, there's a lot to catch up on. Um, Discovery, and you know they've they're they're. Have you been? honed in about a week ago they announced suddenly they're taking a break in discovery and letting prodigy have its air all to itself so oh oh i did not there's a mid-season break that they're this week's i think tomorrow's is the last one and then they'll be back in february but they're gonna let prodigy run through the last five the last five of the first ten. Oh man okay well that happened season <laughs> one and it wasn't that nice because there was a, a lot of people dropped off at that point. Um, okay. But, this, but is a, this is an era when there's not just one season, so one series. No, that's true. That's true. Um, Dave says that and was... A lot a, of people have been uh, seduced by Prodigy that didn't expect to be. So a lot of people have gotten uh, Prodigy's involved. Prodigy's great. Prodigy's great. Um, mm -hmm. Dave says that was a fun time holiday watch along. Um, Linda says, thanks, dogs and lifers. I would have never rewatched that on my own. <laughs> I'm glad. Is that you're welcome? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. You're welcome. And Libby says that was fun, much better than watching it alone. Uh, Glenn says thank you for the watch party. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So, Larry, we'll be back, I think, I guess, to dis talk Discovery on the 8th or maybe Prodigy. I don't know. Who knows? We'll figure it out. But, folks, um, until then, I hope you have a good new year. Um, I hope you're staying safe. It's a tough time with Omicron out there. Um, boy, Larry, we have had our ups and downs here with the pandemic. And here we are talking again about a, a new threat. Um, I hope folks are staying safe. Yeah. Um, I've known some people that have, uh, some fully vaxxed and boosted people that, uh, I think got into a situation with a few people that weren't and, and came down with the um, asymptomatic, but they tested positive for Omicron. So people, I think you know. So oh yeah, I've I've uh, I was just talking to someone who's who's um, going through it right now and is was fully vaccinated and, and boosted um, as well. So it's it's a tough time. Um, so I hope people are taking care of themselves. It's a, it's a great time to watch Star Trek. I will tell you that it's a great time to stay home. Uh, there's a lot of Star Trek out there to watch. If you, and if you're not watching Star Trek, watch For All Mankind. That's great, too. Uh, so, Larry, with that, I'm going to start playing our, our lovely theme song over here for Life Support Live. Okay. Um, between now and our next episode of Life Support, um, what, what, if anything, is going on in Trekland, or what can people catch up on since it's been a while? Um, well, uh, yeah, I'm going to turn around here and get ready for... I've got a Portal 47 guest tonight with the Portales for Jim Conway, who um, who directed many shows over the years, Way of the Warrior and all that. But I've, it lets me say, the gift offer that I have for Portal 47 is still in, the, in on there. So if Santa left you off of your Trek gift list and you were still looking for some Trek for yourself or somebody else, just come over to um, LarryNimacek.com and... Look for the blinkers there, and uh, and I did this for my Tuesdays Live, so I'll say it here. 
if you don't want to buy six months at a time and you just want to join, I'll do a bonus of just do the month to month regular price, but we'll give you the six and the 12th month free. So there's a little holiday for everybody. No big deal. Just click the regular button and I'll know it's you because people joined right now. So that through the first, we'll do that. So awesome. we'd love to hear everybody in the fall. It's going to be a big year. It's going to be a huge year for Trek. No matter when they're taking the breaks of what, it may be 52 straight weeks of, you know, a fresh Trek. Over in my neck of the woods, not much going on, Larry. <laughs> it's been <laughs> it's been pretty pretty quiet. I've got, um, but I am spinning up the dilithium crystals here. I'll have um, some new stuff for people in the new year. Um, but really just been trying to enjoy... I hope you've been taking a break and enjoying things. Yeah, really. I've been trying yeah. to enjoy the time uh, time off with the family here, the holidays. Um, it's been, you know, it, it has been a little hard because it's been raining almost mm -hmm. every day. And because of Omicron, there are, not, there are not a lot of indoor places uh, we can go to here. So it's been... Uh, been kind of a little cabin fever but it's okay we're all safe we're all healthy um i think that's kind of the uh the oh it is raining of... here <laughs> I, i've been in this, i've been in my room since for three hours <laughs> no i think the the prime directive here is to stay safe as well as we can um and uh let's support each other let's uh and let's keep on boldly going into the new year um and with that, which still has its aspect of uncertainty, so yeah. uncertain times. Here we are. So yes. Here we are. Uh, yeah. Um, until next time, folks. Live long and prosper. Yeah, everybody. Trek well.